Ready to Senate come to order? Senate will come to order. Senator from Lexington, what purpose you rise? I'd ask for a call of the Senate, Mr. Call, President. Call of the Senate. Been requested. The clerk will ring the bell. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adams is present. Mr. Alexander is present. Mr. Allen, present. Mr. Bennett is present. Mr. Campson is present. Mr. Cash. Mr. Cash is present. Mr. Clymer is present. Mr. Corbin is present. Mr. Cromer is present. Mr. Davis is present. Mr. Fanning. Absent, Mr. Gambrell. Mr. Gambrell has leave. Mr. Garrett, present. Mr. Goldfinch. Absent, Mr. Grooms, present. Mrs. Gustafson is present. Mr. Harputlian is present. Mr. Hembry is present. Mr. Hutto. Absent, Mr. Jackson has leave. Mr. Kevin Johnson is present. Mr. Michael Johnson is present. Mr. Kimbrell is present. Mr. Kimson. Absent, Mr. Loftus is present. Mr. Malloy. Absent, Mr. Martin. Mr. Martin is present. Mr. Massey, present. Mrs. Matthews has leave. Mr. McElveen has leave. Ms. McLeod, present. Mr. Peeler, present. Mr. Rankin, absent. Mr. Rice is present. Mr. Saab is present. Mr. Scott, is present. Mrs. Sin is present. Mr. Setzler is present. Mrs. Sheely is present. Mr. Stevens is present. Mr. Talley, present. Mr. Turner, present. Mr. Verdon is present. Mr. Williams is present. Mr. Young. Mr. Young is present. Have all members answered the roll? The senator from Charleston. Senator Kimson's present. Polls are closed. There are 36 members present. A quorum is present. Are there any petitions, memorials, presentments of grand jury or such likes paper? The clerk will read. We have some communications. The clerk will read. Message from the governor, Mr. President, members of the Senate. I'm hereby. Placed on the calendar. Further message from the governor, Mr. President, members of the Senate, I am hereby vetoing and returning without my approval S-948, which is a bill which seeks to move the 2022 election date for seats on the Marion County Board of Education from the second Tuesday in April to the second Tuesday in May. Placed on the calendar. No further communications. There are no further communications. Therefore, we are on the introductions of bills and resolutions. The clerk will read. Introduction of a bill by Senator Corbin adds a section to the code to prohibit hospitals and insurance companies from discriminating against potential organ transplant recipients based on a person's COVID-19 vaccination status. If we could, just uh, come to order. Thank you. Mr. President. Medical Affairs. I'd like Senator from Greenville. Can I make some opening remarks about the bill? Senator is recognized for up to three minutes for opening remarks. Ladies and gentlemen of the Senate, as you all know, I've been concerned about vaccine mandates for going back a year and a half before the idea even got popular. Um, it came to my attention last week that a gentleman was on the organ transplant donor list at MUSC and was subsequently removed from that list because he was unvaccinated. This bill will help with that, but in my opinion, doesn't go far enough. 
as it concerned me earlier, what concerns me now that every door is open first with a slight crack, and this General Assembly is going to have to address the notion, are we going to go down the path in this state that people are going to be denied medical treatment because of their vaccine status? I think not, and I would ask that my colleagues help me prevent that because God help us if it ever gets to that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator from Greenville. The bill was referred to medical affairs. Senator from Spartanburg. Senator Martin, what purpose do you rise? To be added as co-sponsor. Without objection. Senator from Buford, what purpose do you rise? For purposes of introduction. Purpose of introduction. You rec recognize for five minutes. Senator, while he's coming, the senator from Greenville, Senator Loftus, what purpose do you like rise? Like to request to be added to uh, Senator Corbin's bill. As a course, as a co-sponsor, so ordered. Senator from Buford. Yes, uh, members of the Senate, this week is the 23rd annual South Carolina Nurse Anesthetist Week. And please join me in recognizing the work of nurse anesthetists and the important role they play in the delivery of safe and effective health care. This year, millions of Americans will undergo surgery or deliver a baby, and most of them will receive their anesthesia care directly from a certified registered nurse anesthetist, or a CRNA. CRNAs give every type of anesthesia for patients of all ages for any kind of procedure and in every setting. This week is devoted to recognizing the work of CRNAs. I would like to thank the more than 1,400 members of the South Carolina Association of Nurse Anesthetists, their president, Elizabeth Wilkes, who resides uh, in Tom Young's district, District uh, 24, and her fellow members for their effort in promoting measures to ensure that South Carolinians have access to quality health care services. In addition to being a main provider in this state, CRNAs are also the main provider of anesthesia care to American servicemen and women stationed throughout the world. It is my honor to recognize South Carolina nurse anesthetists in the work of all CRNAs in our state. Thank you. Thank you, Senator from Beaufort. We recognize them for their service. Clerk. Senator from Kershaw, what purpose do you rise? Uh, uh, Ms. President, I would please like to introduce the doctor of the day. May I be recognized? You're to do recognized so? to be to introduce the doctor of the day. Senator from Kershaw. Good afternoon. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the doctor of the day. And I, it, it's, this is really great because I actually know this doctor very well, and he's a constituent of mine. And um, I'll just start by telling you his name. He is Dr. Garrett Barton. He is from Sherraw, and he and his wife are both family physicians. They have a little two-year-old and one on the way in April. So, uh, yeah, this might be a good break for you this afternoon, <laughs> a little quiet break. Um, he completed his residency at McLeod Hospital in Florence. Um, he is uh, very, very um, passionate about serving uh, good medical care to families and children. And let's welcome Dr. Barrett, um, excuse me, Dr. Garrett Barton to the Senate today. Thank you so much for all you do for um, our, our community and, and welcome. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you, Senator Kershaw. Clerk will read. Introduction of concurrent resolution by Senator Jackson that requests the Department of Transportation name the intersection on Chalk Street and Poultry Lane in Richland County, Deacon David Shiver Memorial Intersection, erect appropriate signs and markers. Transportation Committee. Introduction of H4384, it's a concurrent resolution that requests the Department of Transportation name a portion of U.S. Highway 321 in the town of Fairfax the MF Sonny Riley Jr. Highway and direct appropriate signs and markers. Transportation Committee. Introduction of House Bill 4832. This is a bill that adds a section to the code to establish minimum non-forfeiture amounts for contracts issued after June 30th, 2022. Adds a section to the code to require long-term care insurers to provide notice of proposed premium rate increases to policyholders. Banking and insurance. Finance Committee has reported favorable with amendments on S-952. It's a joint resolution to authorize the expenditure of federal funds dispersed to the state in the American Rescue Plan of 2021 and to specify the manner in which these funds may be expended. Placed on the calendar. 
Introduction of a bill by Senator Campson and others to enact the South Carolina Conservation Enhancement Act. It amends a code related to deed rec recording fee to require a portion of the fee to be credited to the South Carolina Conservation Bank Trust Fund. Senator from Charleston, Senator Campson, what purpose do you to make brief introductory remarks, ex explanatory you, remarks you, about you the bill? You recognize up to three minutes. Thank, thank you, Mr. President and members. Um, what was just read across the desk is the South Carolina Conservation Enhancement Act. And this is a proposal that came from the governor's um, um, Flood Water Commission Task Force. It's really perhaps even the primary uh, uh, recommendation that they've had. Tom Milliken, many of you have heard from Tom. He has uh, led the charge in and getting groups around the state. And we have over 100 groups, conservation groups, business groups, that are supportive of this effort. And what this does is the, it takes the South Carolina Conservation Bank, which is in existence, has been since 2002, has protected over about 330,000 acres at about $500 an acre. 25% of that, that, the land it protects is fee simple. The rest is conservation easement. So it's a very efficient way to protect our wonderful natural resources. I like to say it's conservation by negotiation and compensation, not by regulation. And that's the way the bank works. I'd encourage you to read their annual reports. They're really good. The 2021 annual report came out, I think, last week. But what this does is it reinstates the real estate transfer fees that originally were dedicated to the conservation bank from its inception. We, we removed that dedicated funding source about four years ago when we went through a, a legislative uh, audit council process. Out of that process, the bank is much stronger and better and reformed than it's ever been. Um, and so I, this, is, this now reinstates that funding source. And it's an important, there is a, a relationship between the amount of real estate transfer fees and the need to do conservation because real estate transfer fees go up when there's more development in the state and the need for conservation goes up when there's more development in the state. And this is not taking money from, it's taking it from the general fund. Right now, this, the, the real estate transfer fees, this portion I'm talking about goes to the general fund. It used to be dedicated to the conservation bank until about four years ago. This just rededicates it. It also provides a portion of the sales tax revenue, which is the portion derived from sporting goods and uses a, that, a portion of that sales tax to fund capital improvements, not expenses, not maintenance, but capital improvements to publicly owned land in South Carolina. And there are a lot of co-sponsors. I just invite any of you to sign on as co-sponsor now. Thank Senator you. from Lexington, Senator Satzler, what part? Senator Yield for a question. Senator Yield for Friendly a question. question. Yes, sir. Senator, Senator Yields. You were talking about the bank today. The bank today is a totally different entity than it was four years ago. And the board is a tremendous entity that's working hand in hand with us now, is it not? That is correct, Senator. I would say the Legislative Audit Council product, it's, a, it's an example of it doing a wonderful job and the bank responding to that audit in a way that created significant reforms. We have an incredible um, executive director in Raleigh West. I'd encourage all of you to go online and look at the annual report. You can find it on the Conservation Bank website and to see the great work that it's doing. But anyway, I think I have 22 sponsors, at least one more if we get 23 or you have, to have half the Senate. So, um, but please, I wanted to let you know in case you were interested in co-sponsoring the bill, please inform the desk. Thank you. Thank you, Senator from Charleston. The bill is referred to the Finance Committee. Clerk will read. The Senate Transportation Committee has reported favorable on the following statewide appointments. Member of the Ports Authority, reappointment at large of Mr. Whitmar Seabrook Smith III of Charleston. Received his information. Received his information. Further appointment to the Ports Authority, reappointment at large of Mr. William H. Stern of Columbia. Received his information. Appointment to the Ports Authority, reappointment at large of Ms. Pamela P. Lackey of Columbia. Received his information. 
Member of the Ports Authority Reportment at Large, Mr. Willie E. Jeffries of Ellery. Received his information. Member of the Ports Authority Initial Appointment at Large of Ms. Felicia Rue Howard of Columbia, Vice William Jones. Received his information. Member of the Ports Authority Reappointment at Large, Mr. Kurt D. Grindstaff of Hilton Head. Received his information. Member of the Ports Authority at Large, Mr. William A. Coates of Greenville. Received his information. Member of the Ports Authority Reappointment at Large of Mr. Mark W. Bike Jr. of Florence. Received his information. Senator from Berkeley, what purpose do you rise? Point of personal expression. Recognized for a point of personal expression. Senator from Berkeley. Members of the Senate, yesterday the Review and Oversight Commission on the State Ports Authority screened six incumbent members of the State Ports Authority and two uh, initial appointments to the State Ports Authority. They were found to be qualified. Earlier today, the Senate Transportation Committee voted out favorably um, all eight um, appointees to the State Ports Authority. Some of the um, members have served uh, since uh, or 2000, since the early 2000, and we have two new ones. I, I thought it would be a good idea if they were to hang around a little bit today since the Transportation Committee adjourned um, at about uh, 1245, um, there, or 1145. They're here to say hello. They're here to answer any questions any members may have. Uh, they've made themselves available here today. So if you have a minute during some of these discussions, they're still here. We have them in the ante room, or we'll bring them back into ante room in case any members would have any questions of these port appointees. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator from Berkeley. The reading clerk will read. The House has returned to the Senate with with amendments S203, a bill by Senator Henry and others that amends the code related to the removal of school district trustees and filling vacancies to provide that district trustees guilty of malfeasance, misfeasance, incompetency, absenteeism, conflicts of interest, misconduct, persistent negligence of duty in office or incapacity in shall be subject to removal from office by the governor. Placed on the calendar. The desk is clear. Are there any requests for local bills? Any requests for local bills? Any request? Here, a Senator from Lexington, Senator Sheely, what purpose do you rise? I have a unanimous consent request. State your request. Mr. President, after consulting with the Chairman of Medical Affairs and Judiciary, I ask unanimous consent that we recall S-659 and H-3773 for Medical Affairs and refer them to the Judiciary Committee. S-659 deals with sexually violent predators and H3773 addresses a mentally ill individual's fitness to stand trial. Both of these subjects are more appropriately handled in the Judiciary Committee. Okay, we'll take them one at a time. The first unanimous consent, 659, would be recalled and directed to the Judiciary Committee. Yes, sir. Without, the, without is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. And then is it H3773? Yes, sir. So the pending question would be to discharge that from the committee and it be referred to the Judiciary Committee. Is there any objection to that unanimous consent request? Any objection? Hear none, so ordered. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Are there any other local bills? Hearing none, that takes us to page six, top of the page, S. 150 by the senator from Buford and others with the senator from Buford retaining the floor. The senator from Buford is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just a brief, brief summary of where I think we are right now. Uh, yesterday, I went through the bill in, in some detail, section by section, to give an overview. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that members may have about the sections um, that I discussed. Um, but absent any questions, it would be my intent to take my seat um, and then let others be heard.
But that being said, I am willing to take questions. I realize I've talked to some members and they believe that that is a, a constructive way in which to explore whether or not perfecting amendments are needed. And I've already seen the work product of some of the senators in that regard. And I think the process is working. The Senate's working as it should. Um, but um, I just wanted to let you know that, that I am willing and, re and ready, if not eager, uh, to, to take my seat and to listen to what my colleagues have to say about this. But that said, I'm willing to stand up here and answer questions for as long as the members think that's useful. Senator from Orangeburg, Senator Tato, what purpose do you rise? Well, I don't want to be in front of you taking your seat for too long, but I do have a couple of questions. Was the Senator yield for question? Yes. Senator yields. One of the criticisms or in the discussion uh, over the days have been uh, that uh, the, the FDA has not approved marijuana. Isn't that right? That's some of the members' concerns about the bill um, are that um, even though 37 states have legalized it for medicinal use and even though there are lots of peer-reviewed studies indicating that it's medically efficacious for certain conditions, that we still ought not to allow it unless and until the FDA has approved the drug as it does other drugs. So uh, are you aware that the FDA does not uh, supervise the practice of medicine? I, I am, and, um, and, and in one of the ways I think that's, that's evidenced is that um, physicians, um, those that are in the best position sitting down with a patient and consulting with the patient and the patient's families, um, are given deference, for instance, to um, provide uh, off-label drug use. So, so even if a, a, a drug has been approved by the FDA for a specific condition and deemed safe for treatment of that specific condition, that doesn't trump the physician's ability to assign or prescribe that FDA drug for, for non-approved purposes. So essentially what they're doing is they're relying upon their clinical experience. They're, they're relying upon what they're observing with that patient. And they're not allowing that FDA, quote unquote, steal approval saying it can only be used for this to constrain them. And I, and I think it's a recognition by um, the FDA and by Congress um, who has consistently upheld physicians' rights um, to prescribe off-label drug use that that relationship, physician and patient, is the primary one. And I think there's analogy here in that cannabis, even though it's not FDA approved, should be able to be prescribed or authorized for use by a physician if that physician sitting down with that patient determines it's in that patient's best interest. And I guess, to your point, off-label prescribing is analogous to that. And it, it's legal. Off-label prescribing is done all the time. Is that right? It, it, it is. And, and in fact, I, I looked up, um, there is an American Medical Association Journal of Ethics um, uh, opinion on this that was, was handed down in 2016 talking about the practice of off-label uh, drug prescribing and, and noting that it accounts for up to 10 to 20 percent of all written prescriptions. So what that says to me is that in, in 10 to 20 percent of instances where a physician is deciding what's in that patient's best interest, that physician is making a decision that's not FDA approved. Um, it's not been FDA you know, sanctioned. It's not been FDA reviewed. There's no seal of approval from the FDA saying it's safe. And yet physicians do that because it's recognized that a physician sitting across from a patient reviewing that particular patient's history is the ultimate decider. And, and the reason I think that that's important for us to realize here is this bill is all about that. And, and there's been some discussion um, in recent days about how we shouldn't be a legislature authorizing or prescribing medicine, or we ought not be determining what is medicine. And, and, and what I try to keep bringing the body's attention back to is we're not doing that. Well, in fact, what we're doing is getting out of that. We're, we're, we're empowering doctors and we're saying it doesn't make any sense for us as politicians to stand in, the, in that relationship and to constrain the physician from doing what that physician thinks might be in that patient's best interest. So contrary to what you're hearing out there by some, this is not the legislature imposing itself in medicine. It's the legislature getting out of that and recognizing that is the phys physician's the one that's best able to make that determination. And in fact, we're, we're going further than that. We're saying we're not going to just leave it up to the patient to decide whether they think it'll work or not. They actually have to go to a doctor and not only uh, be diagnosed with one of the, the uh, recognized uh, uh, symptoms, um, uh, I guess, maladies, 
that this might be prescribed for, and then the doctor has to make the decision to actually prescribe it. Because just because you have one of those conditions that might qualify you, a doctor may say, I don't think in your case that's right. Because oftentimes, did you know, doctors will try one thing, and then they may try something else, and then they may try something else. And sometimes, among the things that they try are off-label uses of drugs that aren't approved by the FDA for that particular uh, issue. That, that, that's absolutely right. And, and I tried to make the point the other day, and, and, and perhaps not as clearly as I should, but, but of the 12 qualifying conditions where we list cancer and epilepsy and neurological disorders and chronic pain and Crohn's disease and whatever, all, the, the entire list, it is enti not only entirely possible, it is, it is almost a certainty that in many instances, despite those conditions being listed in here and despite there being peer-reviewed scientific studies that say they could be efficacious, a physician may decide, given this patient's history, um, it is not the right thing for you. And, and I think, you know, that's reflected by the fact that some individuals have severe reactions to marijuana. For instance, if you have a disposition toward um, a psychotic break or schizophrenia, I mean, it's not a good idea to take cannabis. Um, it can exacerbate that condition. And, and so that's why it's so important for, for that physician to have that inpatient diagnosis or in-person diagnosis of that patient. And then let's trust the people that are trained to do this to make those judgments. And, and that's what this bill is all about, is empowering that physician. And, 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 and it's going to also be about um, bringing another medical professional into the loop, the pharmacist, the, the pharmacist who can interact with that patient. And, and I would submit that physician, patient, that relationship, patient, um, pharmacist, that relationship, and then looping back to the physician, that is where these medical decisions need to be made. And um, I, I, what I don't understand is this, this lack of faith that some have in a physician and a patient's ability sitting across from each other to decide what's in that patient's best interest. I mean, to me, that's what liberty and freedom and, and is all about, is, is about empowering individuals. And, and weren't you, I think you were involved in the uh, medical affairs hearings we had during the fall, and we, we discussed exactly that in connection with COVID, where we were saying, let's trust doctors to try the things that they think are in their patient's best interest. And it was, what I heard then was, yes, we should not be not we should not be getting in the way of doctors prescribing what they think is appropriate under the circumstances, even if it may not be FDA approved. And, and that was, and again, there's an analogy here with, with, with cannabis in that, and the argument was made, and you were on that committee, and, and I was on that committee, um, and the doctors came forward and made very persuasive arguments that we, we prescribe things off-label all the time. We're, we're in positions of deciding what's in the patient's best interest. We don't like to have federal medical bureaucracy is however well-intentioned telling us down at the local level what we think is in our patient's best interest. And I think that's a compelling argument. I mean, I, I mean I'm, I'm a politician and I'm a real estate lawyer. I, I, I'm not in a position to be able to tell a doctor what they can and can't do. And, and what we ought to be all about, in my opinion, is making sure that the laws that we pass get out of that relationship and, and let them have that one-on-one -on -one determination of what's in the patient's best interest. And that's, I guess that's what this bill is all about. And so I, I guess the ironic thing is, is that some in opposition would say, this is the legislature trying to step in and be a doctor. And what I would say is, no, it's our recognition of the fact that we aren't and that we ought not be constraining doctors from doing what they think is in their patient's best interest. That, that's right. Let me, let me shift, shift to another area. I know you've drafted this bill to basically be revenue neutral as it relates to, to the state. Is that correct? The way that, the way that it's phrased, um, it, it authorizes or empowers DHEC to impose a series of, of, of fees. It also recognizes that there's a sales tax. And the, the declared intent is that the fees should only be such that would cover it, the cost of administering the program. It's not meant right. to be a revenue raiser. Right. But the other part of it is because there are going to be people that set up businesses and employ workers, and there are going to be farmers who plant crops, and there are going to be manufacturers who manufacture the crops, it is going to provide economic impact to South Carolina, not because of taxes or fees that we will collect, but just because of revenue that will be generated by the actual a new business being established in this state. Is that right? There, there's no question. I mean, the, the economic impact um, to the state in regard to the creation of jobs 
is, is absolutely huge. And, and, and so, um, interestingly, that's why of the 37 states that have legalized cannabis for medical purposes, not one of them has rolled back a program. Not one of them has said, wait a minute, there have been unintended consequences, we need to revisit this. Not one of them has said we made the wrong decision. I think, and that's 37 states, so it's very telling. So, so when we're told out there that these parade of horribles is going to occur if we pass medical cannabis, my argument back is point to a medical cannabis law in a state whereby that has been the case and the General Assembly of that state has rolled things back. It hasn't happened. I mean, these things just aren't, aren't real, which is why you don't see the claims that are made in some of the emails and Facebook ads and all these things that are out there. They're never footnoted to studies. They're never footnoted to, to states that have changed those laws. It's just fear-based. It's, 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 it's rhetoric. And, and what I've tried to do is, is I've tried to walk through and say, okay, this is what the law is. This is what federal law is. The CSA is not uh, preempt the field. On its face, it says it doesn't preempt the field. It invites the states to take actions in the space of controlled substances. I I've talked about the case law that says adoption of medical cannabis laws doesn't even constitute implied preemption either. So there is no federal restriction in regard to us acting, and that's borne out by the fact that 37 states have them and their laws aren't, aren't challenged. And, and so you and I had the opportunity to go up to Maryland and look at uh, a state-of-the-art grow house. Actually, it looked like it was inside of a, of a mall. Um, you would think it might be out in a field, but this was an inside grow house that we visited. Is that right? We did, and, and um, I, I wish every member would have the opportunity to go and see what, what these um, growing facilities look like. I mean, it's like walking into a, a, a giant laboratory. I mean, and it's... Absolutely, and, and one of the things that struck me is that the head of the growing part was a Clemson graduate. Well, I was about to say that, that there were two people well, there. the head of the lab was a College of Charleston it, it, graduate. We had two of South Carolina's best and brightest in, in terms of, of molecular biology and science, and they were up there employed as, as scientists working with uh, the GROW, um, diagnosing what the strains were, what the CBD and the THC ratios were, doing research in regard to, okay, this sort of ratio will help with uh, chronic pain. This sort of ratio tends to help with nausea. This, this kind of ratio tends to stimulate appetite for those who have had chemotherapy. I mean, and, and what I want is instead of our best and brightest going to other states and working those facilities, have them here and have that intellectual capital here in South Carolina. These were students that, that we had helped pay for their college education because they both attended public universities yeah. in South Carolina. And their chosen field, they can't do here in South Carolina. They actually were testing different strains uh, versus different maladies and illnesses. They were, one, I mean, I, as I recall, uh, if you could remember, they, they would have uh, a, a different strain, I call it a strain, a different mm -hmm. variety of marijuana, and they would test it to see whether it affected sleep or whether it affected people with PTSD or wh whatever. Uh, and, and so they were trying to focus particular strains of the plant on particular problems that people would, ha would have. It's, it's, it was really extraordinary, and, and it, 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 it really challenges us to rethink the notion of medicine in that What's different about cannabis and, and how it addresses some of these various conditions as opposed to what pharmaceuticals do, it interacts with the body. It interacts with the body's endocannabinoidal system and it attacks the imbalances that manifest themselves in these, in these conditions. And so it is a, it is a holistic way of, of going about. And, and look, there's a reason why 37 states have passed this. Even in the face, in each one of those states, you had law enforcement, um, opposed to it in those states. You had the religious community opposed to it saying you're going to be on a slippery slope to, to widespread marijuana use. I mean, all those, that opposition was there. This isn't different in South Carolina. And, and yet, in the end, they passed the laws because the science is clear. The logic is clear. The, the, the governmental philosophy is clear. I mean, we want to give primacy to that patient-physician relationship. I mean, that's all very compelling stuff. And, and, and to those who are opposed to this bill, I would pose this question, what right is there, what right does the state have to step into that relationship and say, nope, I'm sorry, 
I don't care about all the studies that say this is efficacious. I don't care about all the, the personal stories you've heard about how relief is being provided. We're not going to let you do that. That's the practice of medicine. That, that, that proscription in our code is the practice of medicine. So I, I just, I mean, when I read it, it, it just infuriates me saying, Senator Davis thinks he knows better than doctors. Senator Davis wants to stand up there and, 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 and talk about what patients should take for their conditions. Nothing could be further from the truth if you read the bill. What I'm doing is empower, what we're doing, hopefully, is empowering physicians in getting the state out of that role because it doesn't belong there. And do you recall that when we uh, visited the distribution center, not the growth center, but the distribution center, that it wasn't in a seedy neighborhood? It was right there on a, on a highway right next to a lot of other businesses. It, 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 was, it was, as I recall, a $15 million, uh, the, the growth facility was a $15 million facility with state-of-the-art technology. I know Chairman Verdon was there as well, and, and others may have, may have visited these facilities. It is, and, and, and even under this bill, it's an extremely regulated clean, scientific thing because we're talking about medicine. And, and, and in this bill, um, we're talking about it being tested by an independent lab. We're talking about it put in child-resistant packaging. We're talking about it being labeled. We're talking about having pharmacists be involved in the dispensing. We're treating this as we should, like medicine. And, and when we went to the place where uh, patients would show up, they had to show their ID to come inside. They, we ended, we, where they allowed us to talk to people. A lot of them were veterans. We, we, it's not like we walked up and there were just tons of hippies walking no. in. These were, we were, these were folks, some had canes, some told us about the PTSD they'd suffered from being involved in the, in the military. And these folks were telling us what relief they got from this. They all had prescriptions and walked in, showed their ID, and then there was a uh, uh, an assistant, I don't know, I guess they weren't really pharmacists, but there was a tech, not tech uh, person there who could kind of walk them through options about whether you wanted this or you wanted that and what particular strains might, might treat. And uh, you remember also that we went back and watched how they handled the money and they had to track all of that, you know, to the penny they had to track that because at the time, back then, they couldn't even, I guess, deposit it directly into banks. They had to have like an armored car come around and pick up the, and so the point is, this is very much a, a business that was run in the open and transparently when we viewed that facility in Maryland, isn't that right? A absolutely, and when you mention meeting the PTSD patients that go in there, um, I, I wanna make this point maybe clearer than I have in, in the past few days. There's been a lot of talk about the consequences of what might happen if we pass this bill, societal ills. I, I don't think there's any credible evidence for that, but we've talked a lot about the consequences of, of acting. We haven't focused enough on the consequences of not acting. And, 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 and the suicides that are occurring out there right now, we know this from PTSD veterans who have lost, who've seen, talked to their comrades and they just can't take it anymore. By not acting, by not acting, we are perpetuating that cycle of suicides, of, of people who put themselves in harm's way for us. We're making people like Margaret Richardson, in her words, creep around like a criminal and have to go out and buy marijuana, and she doesn't know what's going to be in it, but she has to buy it because it's the only thing that works for her. And, and, and our challenge here, and one that I know we're going to meet, figuring out a way to safely get that medicine in the hands of people who desperately need it. And, and, and that has been the objective all along in this. It's why it's called the Compassionate Care Act. And, you know, and these emails, for some reason, that Drew McKissick at the Republican Party seeks emailing out, on behalf of sheriffs, ostensibly, although they're all cut and pasted, so you know it's drafted by, by one person, starts out the letter, the first one said, don't get me wrong, I'm compassionate. This latest one said, don't get me wrong, I'm extremely compassionate. Well, guess what? Compassion is demonstrated through acts, not words, okay? You can't on the one hand say that you're extremely compassionate, and on the other hand, fight the adoption of a law that would get medicine in the hand of veterans, get medicine in the hand of people who are in the aftermath of chemotherapy, medicine in the hand of a child who is suffering hundreds of seizures an hour, just they're twitching on the ground because it won't work when we know cannabis can address it. I mean, there are consequences, Senator from Orangeburg, to us not acting. And I think we're oblivious to some of those. And one of those is that an alternative that if you don't allow this is you, you give doctors and patients the, the Potential that they're going to prescribe them an opioid. And, 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 and the opioids, the, go, you're going to go and, down a whole other... And that's the other thing, is that 
And, and again, we have the experience of looking at states that have had this in place for decades. We know there is an undeniable direct correlation, nobody can challenge it, between the availability of medical cannabis and the decrease in the number, amount of opioids that are prescribed and the decrease in the amount of opioid overdoses. These are deaths that can be prevented. And so again, there are consequences for us not acting, okay? And I recall uh, one of our committee meetings talking to uh, a veteran who had an array of pills that he was taking. It, he said he could get rid of all of those if he could get marijuana. So number one, somebody's paying for that, either on, in his insurance or through Medicaid or Medicare or TRICARE or whatever he is on, somebody's paying for all that medicine. All of that could be cut out as a savings to the overall health care system if he could just get the most effective medicine that he needs, which was prescription marijuana. No, no question about that. I mean, there's so many, again, and, and, and I'm glad we're having this exchange, uh, particularly in regard to the off-labeling, because people seem to be praying to the FDA God, okay, as if, as if somehow the FDA is going to stamp this thing, and that's got to be the be-all and end-all, and that's the way you access medicine. And the point is that a non-FDA-approved drug for a condition can be prescribed by a doctor if, in that doctor's opinion, it can be efficacious. We always defer. We always defer to that doctor down there with that patient, as we ought. Because if something is FDA approved, that doesn't mean a doctor has to prescribe it. No, of course not. And, and they don't do that now. So that's the point I wanted to start, I think I started out with. The FDA does not control the practice of medicine. And, and in fact, um, when Congress, um, uh, when FDA periodically tries to rein in off-label prescribing, Congress steps in and has, quote, repeatedly taking legal steps to prevent the FDA from interfering with the practice of medicine. Okay, so, so the FDA doesn't like it. I mean, any, any bureaucracy is going to like power, right? right? They don't like the fact that physicians off-label prescribe, um, but Congress repeatedly says, you're not involved in the practice of medicine, FDA, and we're not going to take away the authority from that physician down at that patient level if that physician believes it's in that patient's best interest. And again, I keep coming back to that because th this whole bill was drafted with that in mind. This is our bill. It isn't California's bill. It's not Colorado's bill. Our, our committee decided that what we wanted to do was empower physicians, respecting that relationship, and trying to figure out a way to give them options in the event that prescription drugs don't address the conditions. And, and so I, I, I'm proud of this legislation. I think it's legislation South Carolinians can be proud of. Heck, it's what South Carolinians are saying they want us to do. Um, by, by over like 70 percent. Well, and, 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 and oh, but. Even without, you know, just a bald question, do you favor legalizing marijuana, for, uh, you know, for, for, for medicinal use, you get a majority. Um, I think it's 60 percent to 40 percent, something like that. But to your point, when you do pushes, when you say, would your opinion change, would you be more likely to favor it if you knew it reduced in opioid overdoses? Would you be more likely to be in favor of it if you knew it helped individuals in the aftermath of cancer? Would you be more? And it goes off the charts you know, let more likely. You know what doesn't move them is when they're said, would you be more likely or less likely if you knew law enforcement opposed it? Would you be more likely or less likely if you knew that the uh, religious social conservatives opposed? That doesn't change their minds. What, what moves people is being educated as to what the, thing, what the medicine can do. And, and I think the people are way ahead of us on this, okay? They are, and the reason they're ahead of us is most of them have family members, most of them have personal firsthand experience of how cannabis has changed a life. Most of them know somebody like a Margaret Richardson, okay, who, who knows they don't have any alternatives, who know they're going out there and buying marijuana illegally because they have to. They don't know what's in it. They don't know what adulterants are in it. And it's a horrible way for, for us to set public policy. And so I, so I, I, I want to focus on the effects of us not acting are, because those effects of our not acting are, are multitudinous and undeniable, unlike the fears of what might happen if we do act. And so what you just pointed out is that what moves people when they think about it is they're moved by the science, not by the soundbite. Absolutely. And, and what, what's been remarkable to me, despite this, this, this full-scale effort by the South Carolina Republican Party cutting, pasting, you know, mistruths, quite frankly, and sending it out there, I have not received, you know, 100 to 1, they're saying, 
Stay the course, Senator Davis. Don't believe those lies. I mean, follow the science. Do what's best for patients. Empower doctors. I mean, it's just sort of like when they sent that, that flyer out there with me wearing that Hawaiian shirt. I mean, it didn't hurt me. It doesn't hurt me because people understand this. And, and, you they're look, not, and you look good in it. And I did. They, they got a good picture of me. And, and the, thing, the thing of it is, this, people's real world experience isn't matching up with what they're being told here. And people aren't stupid, OK? They know. They know in talking with families and friends and themselves, they understand, okay? And they're not going to be persuaded, I don't think, by mass emails cut and pasted by the Republican Party with a sheriff's name slapped at the end. I just don't think that's going to do well, it. Well, I, I don't either. And I thank you for your hard work on this. And I, I guess we will see what some of the opposition has to say. Thank you. Senator from Anderson, Senator Cash, what purpose do you rise? See if the senator would yield for a few questions. Senator, yield for a few questions. Uh, senator, senator yield, to you, my friend senator from Anderson. From you. Yes, sir. Senator, I'll, I'll try to get through this as quickly as possible. Sure. Uh, in section 4453-2080 is a section about the uh, form that's got to be filled out by the physician. I'm, I'm sorry, Senator. I'm, I'm getting to it. Um, well, it's a simple question. The way I read it, I, I just want to make sure that uh, from what I can tell, the physician would have to fill one of these forms out for each patient each year. Correct. It's an annual certificate. So it, after a year, you've got to go back to the doctor if you haven't been and get another certificate. Is that a, a yes or no? Yes, yes. Okay. It's, it's That's an all thing. I need to know there. Yes. All right, 4453, 2100. Senator, I, I, uh, I think there are some valid concerns among people who oppose this bill about uh, not those who, like Ms. Richardson, uh, are in her circumstances, but, but people who will try to use this as a loophole to get marijuana products, okay? I mean, I think that's a valid concern. Now. What every senator in here is trying to figure out, and at the end of the day, it's going to affect their vote is, you know, does the compassionate side here of, of helping uh, people like Ms. Richardson, how does that weigh out with the public safety aspect if you believe that uh, it's going to lead to more drug addiction and abuse and so on and so forth? So I, I don't, I'm not going to go down either, either side of that argument. I, I, I don't think that people who vote against this lack compassion. Uh, I don't think that people who support this are against law enforcement, okay? Uh, I just discount both of those arguments if you're just going to take them to the extreme. People are trying to, to balance this out in their mind, and that's why we're going to have a lot of move, amendments so, so people can try to improve this as the way they see fit. But Just a comment on that, um, and, and, and I encourage that. And I said from the very first day that I was in here, I wanted to know what my colleagues thought about this. I wanted to pick this apart and to make it the best bill possible. And from some of the amendments that I've seen drafted and being put on the desk, that's exactly what's occurring here. And, 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 and I appreciate this effort, Senator from Anderson. Sure. So under point four, let's talk about PTSD, because I do think there's a valid concern here uh, that someone can go to the physician and say, well, I've got PTSD. I would like to get a card. And in the PTSD section, uh, allows for a card uh, if you've been in an active combat zone, a victim of a violent or sexual crime or, or first responder, although that gets preempted, you know, for those who are in public safety. But there's also a phrase in there that says includes this, but it's not limited to this. And so, Senator, can you understand there's a concern among people that people who just want to use cannabis products are going to maybe go to a physician and say, well, I've had a, a traumatic experience. I was in a car accident. Whatever experience they want to name is, is being the trauma. Uh, if they go to a physician who's a little bit lax on the way they write their certificates or do their investigations, they're going to walk out with a certificate for cannabis products. Do you understand that concern? I, I, I do, and, and in, in subcommittee and in full committee, um, in regard to two of the qualifying conditions 
there were concerns expressed by some members that they may be somewhat subjective in nature, one being PTSD, the other being chronic pain. And, and in regard to chronic pain, the way I attempted to get at that was saying that there had to be an affirmative, objective diagnosis by the physician as to the etiology of that pain. So in other words, it had to be tied to an observable and diagnosed underlying condition. And, and I tried to do the same thing in regard to, to PTSD. I tried to flesh it out by, by making it so that it wasn't enough simply to go in and say, I've been through a harrowing experience, I'm, I'm experiencing flashbacks. I've tried to craft it in a way that would, uh, and in fact, we've charged the department with, um, to, to quote from the section you're referring to, providing guidelines for the types of evidence accepted to confirm that an applicant experienced one or more traumatic events. Acceptable evidence must include, okay, that's a baseline, but is not limited to proof of military service in an active combat zone, zone, that the person was the victim of a violent or sexual crime, or that the person was a first responder. So in some sense, what I've done here, or what we've done here, or what the committee's done here, is, is recognize that there is a subject, subjectivity to the PTSD diagnosis, charge the department with developing regs that would assist a physician in, in, in trying to document, as it were, the underlying condition that gave, the underlying event that gave rise to the PTSD. I'm, I'm open to other ways of doing it. This was my best shot at it. Um, if there are other ideas in this body about how we can tie it uh, objectively to an event that actually happened uh, in, in a way that's somewhat respectful of, of the patient, um, um, I'm open to it. Thank you, Senator. I mean, I, I raise that because there might be someone out, out here who, who could bring forth an idea. I've tried to think about it. I have not come up with, with uh, something better, but I do see there's a valid concern here uh, with the PTSD. Now, I wanted to ask you a question going to Section 4453-2130. Yes, sir. Which is about getting an ID card. Right. Senator, I'm not looking for a long answer here, but I do want to, to raise the point and, and, and get a brief response of, so if someone has a, a, a past history of drug use, uh, even to the point of uh, selling drugs, do, do you... Do you have any caution there about them being allowed to go in and, and get a car? Uh, then maybe they've got PTSD. I, I guess I, my answer would be no, I don't, because the requirement of the physician diagnosis is, is, so, is so exhaustive. Um, the penalties for, for, for violating it are, are a felony. Um, and, and so um, I, I take comfort in that. But, but I understand your, your argument is that if a patient has a past history of illegal use of a substance, that perhaps you can draw an inference that they might be going through this process. But, but I would make this point. Those individuals who want to consume marijuana recreationally or illegally, they're doing it now. And, and, and they, can do, they can continue to do it now um, much more cheaply than it would cost them if they, if they tried to get medical cannabis, because medical cannabis is gonna be much more expensive because of the quality controls we're building in. Um, and the violation for possessing it illegally uh, is, a, is in many cases a misdemeanor if you do it illegally, but a felony if you try to abuse the medical cannabis process. So I, I don't think for, you know, and, and assuming this is a, a rational actor out there, if they're, if they're looking at the cost of getting the marijuana to get themselves high, or if they're looking at the penalties and the criminal penalty of getting caught, they're not gonna go through a medical cannabis program and pay more for medical cannabis and risk committing a felony than they are right now buying it illegally and risking committing a misdemeanor. Senator, I wanna ask you a question uh, at section 4453-2200. And this also, uh, let me try to articulate the question because it also takes into account uh, some phrasing in section 2210, and then uh, and and the basic uh, question I'm trying to get at here in reading these sections is, from your perspective and what you've tried to write here, 
How much cannabis product could someone actually have on hand? And what I mean by that is the law allows you to, to go and get a 14-day supply of cannabis products every 14 days, right? Right. So uh, let's say you go and you get 10 bags of gummy, gummy bears, but you only use two bags. So now you've got eight bags left over, but after 14 days, you go back and you get 10 more bags, and you only use t two bags. And, and, and you see what I'm saying? The, the product begins to accumulate. And so in looking at the language here, I'm, I'm wanting to, to know what you think it means, because in, in 2210A, uh, you're not subject to arrest as long as you do not possess more than the allowable amount of cannabis products. But if I'm buying what's allowed every 14 days, and you could argue I'm, I don't possess more than the allowable amount, I, I bought what I could buy every 14 days, even though I now have a maybe a two month supply built up because I haven't used it all. And at point E, we get back to the same question a cardholder is presumed to be lawfully in possession of cannabis products if the cardholder possesses an amount of cannabis products that does not exceed an allowable amount of cannabis products. And so the question becomes, now, I, if, you've, if you've got, you know, through not using it all, a bunch on hand, are, are you in violation yes, of the law? Yes, you, you are, because under the definitional section in 44-53-2010, which in, in uh, 1A, which defines what allowable amount of cannabis is, it, it talks about specific restrictions in regard to um, the, um, the milligrams of the substance that you can have uh, depending upon the mode of consumption. And so if you've got in your possession at any one time an amount that's in excess of what is permitted during a two-week window, you are in violation of, of this section because you are now in possession of a disallowable or non-allowable amount of cannabis. I mean, the fact that the fact that you legally possessed it within that two-week period initially, the fact that you didn't use all of it and allowed it to accumulate, you're going to get yourself into a position where you're beyond those two-week thresholds and you're in violation of this of this law. And and if that's not clear, I mean, we can put up an amendment to make that clear because it is certainly not the intent to say to a patient. Okay, you're authorized to get up to a two-week supply here, but feel free to kind of stow away whatever you want. Okay, I understand um, your, your thinking, and, and it might need a little wordsmithing there, because I also think, on the other hand, if someone is coming towards the end of their two-week period, uh, and they've still got a little bit on hand, when they go to the, the whatever we're calling it now, the pharmacy, and buy another two week supply, you know, for a brief period of time there, they're going to be probably over the allowable amount because they've got the entire two week supply plus the little bit that was left over before they went. So, so there maybe, might have to be yeah, some words. That's, that's there. fair. Maybe some cleanup language to account for both instances. I mean, one, um, to make clear that the accumulation um, of, of an amount beyond the two week allowance is, is not going to be um, permitted but also maybe creating some safe harbor to protect um, the, the, the unwitting violation by some who weren't out of their prescription or their authorization when they went back and got another two weeks. That, that's a fair point. All right, Senator, it's section 4453-2350. Yes, sir. This gets into the uh, part of the, of the bill where now uh, the local government has to decide, or the department the department has to decide who's going to get these licenses to operate a right. cultivation center, a processing center, et cetera. Correct. Uh, and point 2A, and I, I, I just don't know what this means. When, when you say you're going to have a scoring system, and the first thing on the scoring system says the preference of the local government. So what, what, what uh, does that mean in, in your thinking? Uh, some of these other things are very clear to me. That, that's not clear at all. I mean, the local government gets to have a preference in the scoring system. Well, what, what kind of preference? What does it even mean? Well, I think, I mean, it's, it, it relates back to what's said earlier is in, in cases in which more applicants apply than are allowed by the local government. I guess 
this is an attempt to, to bring into the decision-making process by DHEC what the wishes of a local community are as expressed by that local government. Um, and so um, in, in cases where there's already maybe one pharmacy or, 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 or two pharmacies, it may be a relevant factor for DHEC to consider the fact that the, that the local government doesn't think they need to have three pharmacies. I guess it's an attempt to incorporate into the selection process what local governments would like their communities to look like. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make that part of the decision-making process. I understand, Senator. I just don't know if we've arrived at it there because in point number two, uh, you're talking about in cases in which more applicants apply than are allowed by the local government, the numerical system must include analysis of the preference of the local government. So the local government doesn't get to look at five applications for, for two dispensaries, so to speak, and say, well, I know that person, so no, I don't, I don't we're going to give them yeah. a bonus point. I mean, yeah, the, the, I'm not sure what it means. Yeah, no, the intent, the intent is not in regard to the preference of the local government in regard to competing applicants, as I read it. The intent is whether or not there are more than one um, uh, establishments in the municipality or the local government, do they want to have multiple ones? So I, I view it being more of um, a concern about the aggregate number of these dispensary outlets or pharmacy outlets, whatever it ends up being. But I'm happy to look at that and if that needs to be cleaned up. But that, that was the intent there, not to have the local government weigh in and say, we like okay. person X or not I, I, person Z. I'll follow you, Senator. We, we maybe can get together and look at that language because... Uh... And, and while we're talking about Senator from Anderson, I think it's useful to have this discussion as well because it's going to have to be, take place. What degree of, of control do we want local governments to have through their land use regulations? The, the way that it's this phrased right now in this bill is that a local government through its police powers can decide which areas uh, within their jurisdiction they want these sorts of establishments or pharmacies to be. I know there's going to be some amendments being put on the desk that will say that if a municipality wants to, it can pass zoning laws which completely prohibits any, any dispensing pharmacy uh, at all. So, so, so I just want to presage that debate that I know is coming while we're touched upon the local government language. All right. Uh, I'm almost through here, Senator, but in this same section, point number 15, um, if you could go there. Yes, sir. It says that any time the department may promulgate regulations allowing additional categories of medical cannabis establishments to operate. You I'm, know, sorry, right what section, I'm sorry, what section again is that, Senator? I'm sorry. Well, it's 24. It's the same section. It's just point number 15. 2350? That's section 2350? <laughs> well, it's point number B. It comes after point number 15. 2350. Point B, capital B. Okay, okay, I was, okay, let me get to B. Okay, I'm there now. <laughs> it says the department can, can develop regulations allowing additional categories of medical cannabis establishments. I mean, what the bill de deals with right now is the cultivator, the processor, the dispenser. Uh, I know those three, unless I'm forgetting one. But yeah, yeah. Grow, have you got growers, a such processors, as dispensers, transporters, and independent lab analysis. Those are the five. Okay, so I mean, you're familiar with a lot of the state laws. Are there other kinds of medical establishments that are you are thinking of, or why would we, in, in such a detailed law, want to just give the department carte blanche to develop a new kind of medical cannabis establishment? I'm not sure the, this body would want to do that. Okay, this. I take your point, but I can give you my thought process here, okay. was, was that once something moves from the theoretical, which is it he, is here, and moves to the real at reality and, and in practice and what's happening out there, this attempted to give the department some latitude in the event the way markets are operating out there didn't fall strictly within the five categories that we've delineated. But, but I take your point. Your, your point is if, if it's a material thing, in terms of the type of medical cannabis establishments we want to have, that ought to be something that if it's not working the way that it ought, perhaps the remedy is back here in the General Assembly, not through department changing it through reg. My thought process was it'd be less cumbersome if we could simply 
um, see how it works in practice and see whether or not the model that we contemplated in this, in this legislation worked. And to the extent that there were adjustments that needed to be made, it could be more effectively done through the department. But I take your point. I mean, it's, we can debate whether or not that's something the General Assembly should do and not an agency. All right, my last question here is section 4453-2370. This is about the real-time seed-to-sale tracking system. Yes, sir. I'm not looking for an exhaustive explanation of that because that's going to be an exhaustive system. I, I was a computer programmer in a previous lifetime, and I wouldn't want to be the one having to develop this system. But are we actually saying that every seed or at least every single plant is somehow accounted for in this process from the time that seed gets put in the ground. It grew, it didn't grow. We have a plant, we don't have a plant. The plant went here and we can track that plant all the way to a dispensary. It, it, and, and I understand, and I saw this in practice, it is barcoded in, in such a way that it is tracked in that manner. And, and all I can say is, uh, again, we've had, um, technology, innovations, bright minds stepping in to try to go ahead and meet this particular need in, in, in states that have legalized it for medical. And so you've seen some very sophisticated computer tracking systems. And so, I mean, I'm going to get way out of my depth here quickly. But, well, all but, I really mean simply is, are we actually talking about, just so we know, this system tracks a single seed or it tracks a single plant. It's that it is. It is that thorough. It is that. It is that thorough. It is. A, it is quite literally a seed to sale tracking well, that, program. That's what I want to know. I, I'm yes, not sir. asking you to explain the system. Thank you. Thank you, Senator from McCormick. Senator Garrett was. was it Senator. Uh, yield. Uh, I yield to my friend. So just, just a second, uh, Senator from Spartanburg. What purpose do you rise? I rose to ask the senator from Beaufort a question. Okay, well, Senator, was standing outcome to you next. Then, thank you, sir. I didn't. Protocol. The senior senator gets. I mean, I'm fine with that. I'm sorry. I'll yield if Senator Senator yes, Senator from Spartanburg. Senator McCoy be refused. Senator McCoy. Thank you. Thank you for all that you've done in medical marijuana, and for Miss Richardson. I sincerely appreciate that, and I want to help you with Miss Richardson. But let's suppose on the other side over there we got Cheech and Chong. I want to make sure that what we do here doesn't help the Cheech and Chongs of South Carolina. Do you agree with that? I do. And, and, and the reason I agree with you, Senator from McCormick, is um, I think that's what South Carolinians want. I think they want to help the Mrs. Richardsons, but they do not want to authorize legal or uh, adult or recreational use. And so that, that's my objective. You, you, and and that's, that's a way of phrasing it. And I, and I want to work with you. So I, but there's several things I want to talk about. First, are you familiar with the doctrine of comity, M-O-C-O-M-I-T-Y? C-O-M-I-T, yes, I am. All right, and, and could you explain that to the body? What well, the do doctrine of comity, as I understand it, is between different sovereigns or, or different um, levels of le legislature and, and Congress passing laws and South Carolina passing laws, the doctrine of comity encourages them to be read in harmony, is my understanding of it. And that, that may be an imperfect one, but that's my understanding. And that's a, a clean uh, statement of what comedy is. So as a matter of public policy, South Carolina can adopt a comedy approach to this le uh, legislation, or it can be opposed to that. Would you agree with that? Um, I guess I would answer the question this way. Um, be because the Controlled Substances Act, which is the, the federal law that we're working with here, as opposed to state laws that, that are in this space. I mean, so for purposes of comedy discussion, those are the two different types of laws we're talking about, the Controlled Substances Act and the state laws. Um, I do not think, and, 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 and courts, uh, cases that have considered it, um, have, have not concluded that passing of medical cannabis laws constitutes a lack of comedy with what the federal government has done with the CSA, because the CSA on its face expressly says it is not intended pr to preempt state action in the space of controlled substances, and, and because in its operation, medical cannabis laws um, do not um, make enforcement of the federal law impossible, so that there's no obstacle or, or implied preemption either. So I guess I would answer it by saying, I don't view the adoption of a medical cannabis law to be a violation of the principles of comedy. 
All right, and, and that's fine. But I'm talking now also about public policy. What is South Carolina's policy? In your earlier statement, three days ago maybe, you made the statement that South Carolina was behind on the question of medical marijuana. You remember saying that? I do, and I made the statement in the context of um, there are 37 states that have legalized um, cannabis for medicinal purposes, but I would also um, um, state that um, back in 1980, South Carolina passed a medical cannabis law, and, but the body of, of that law um, incorporates or embeds in it that the state can take action in regard to making ca medical cannabis available to patients if it's okay and authorized by federal law. Okay, that's embedded in that 1980 act. So, um, so I, I don't, I mean, that really is, 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 is kind of a dead letter, which is why you never saw anything done with that 1980 law because action by DHEC in that law was predicated upon a rescheduling of marijuana as a Schedule I drug. So, so I don't count that as being um, you know, ahead of the game in, in that respect, although you know, what I wish they had done back then is, is passed a medical cannabis law that said, irrespective of it being a Schedule I drug at the federal level, we authorize DHEC or we, allow, we want to allow businesses in South Carolina to make this available to patients who, who are authorized by physicians to take it. Well, again, this completely took care of the issue as it related to questions of, of cancer, as it related to questions of chemotherapy, and as it related to the question of glaucoma. Back in 1980, this legislature, this body, recognized the importance of allowing South Carolinians to explore these substances, correct? But, but it did so, Senator from McCormick, in a way that said DHEC could not take action and citizens of South Carolina could not access medical cannabis unless it was in, accord in accordance with the federal government rescheduling as, uh, from a Schedule One to a Schedule Two. So it really, I understand your point, we did pass a medical cannabis law back in 1980, but the reason it's been a dead letter, the, the reason that it hasn't led to, to any availability of cannabis to people who need it is because it is tied to that Controlled Substances Act scheduling of cannabis. Okay, so uh, again, I found the word federal some 20 some odd times maybe in your bill. And for something that has been preempted as you have made this argument, then why we keep talking about federal in our state law? Because individuals um, and yourself in Medical Affairs Committee have raised concerns about whether it is violative of federal law. It is, um, isn't I, it? I, you I, agree it is? It, it is not. It is not. For the reasons that I've stated, because preemption has not taken place in the CSA, um, and, and, and it bears repeating here as well, every year Congress passes a budget proviso that says the DOJ can't spend any of their appropriated funds to challenge states that have medical cannabis laws. So, so to say somehow that what states are doing in, is, is in violation of federal law, if that were the case, you would see injunctions issued by federal district courts against states that have medical cannabis laws. That hadn't happened. Somebody's got well, to file it, don't no, they? But when the challenges have occurred, okay. and, and in the Arizona case that I cited, well, let me um, ask you that. Let, well, me, let me just finish the question. In the Arizona case that I cited, when a challenge did occur on the grounds that this is violative of federal law, the court concluded in a decision reciting Supreme Court what cases court are you that it was about? not. Are you talking about Arizona, a, a, a the, the, state court case or a federal court case? It was a, a state court case. State court that case. applied federal laws of preemption. Right. Mm -hmm. right. That's a state court case. I got a United States Supreme Court case I want to talk to you about in just a moment. Okay. But under the CSA, you didn't read the entire CSA because there's a, a, a bottom, an end to that. After the CAA talks about it, that's not going to trip the field, it's not going to preempt. Then it says at the end, and have you got, the, have you got it with you there? I've got, I've got a copy of my, my preemption section here. I don't have the entire CSA Act. Well, let um, me read this to you and tell me whether or not this is in the law of the CSA. You read part of it, but the rest of it is the rest of the story. No provision of this subchapter shall be construed as indicating an intent on the part of Congress to occupy the field in which that problem operates, including criminal penalties, the exclusion of any state law on the same subject matter, which would otherwise, within the authority of the state, then it says unless, and that's the part you didn't read, between that provision of the subchapter and the state law, so that the two can't 
stand consistently together. And let me, let me take that point. There should be a presumption in favor of uh, preemption, preemption where a state law interferes with Congress's ability to regulate interstate commerce, including drugs. And I mean, let me ask the question mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. Isn't that in the rest of the story as it relates to what CSA said? That is what it says, and in, right. and it, let me answer your question. And in, in the case that I cited, okay, the Arizona case that, that applied federal preemption law, it said that state medical cannabis laws do not prevent the federal government from enforcing the CSA, does not prevent a single federal agent from coming down into states and saying that this is a controlled Schedule I substance, and therefore the court ruled that there was no preemption. There wasn't the interference that you just talked about. And you so my it. point is, my po I think you're making my point for me, right. is that not only does it say expressly they don't intend to preempt the field, it then quite logically says, okay, but you can't have implied preemption either. You can't pass a law that says in South Carolina, federal government, you can't enforce the CSA in South Carolina, and any attempt to do that is going to be met with force by us. That would be a, 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 an implied preemption. It would be impliedly preempted. But that's not what we have this here. This whole preemption thing is a rabbit hole. Look. Do you agree with me, uh, counsel, that the supremacy clause controls all of this? Do you agree with that? The United States supremacy there clause. There is a supremacy clause in the Constitution. What I will say to you is, Doesn't I'm, I'm going to I'm, I'm gonna finish my answer, yes. okay? Go ahead. I have researched the case law in regard to if and when federal laws preempt and preclude state action. Okay. In the case of medical cannabis laws, it is not preempted expressly in the CSA, nor is it preempted impliedly because there's nothing in medical cannabis laws that prevents the federal government from coming in and enforcing the Controlled Substances Act. There has not been, point me to one decision, one decision where a state medical cannabis law has been struck down and held invalidated because it is, it is in violation of the CSA and makes it impossible for the federal government to enforce it. Gonzalez versus Raich. That didn't track down a medical cannabis law. I hate to tell you this. No. It is the Supremacy Clause case. It was a six to three opinion, 2005 opinion. In that case, we had two individuals, two females growing dope. And as they were growing their dope, the Sheriff's Department, Butte County, I believe it was, California, and DEA flew over and saw the mm -hmm. cannabis. Mm -hmm. You can see it from there. Mm -hmm. And so they went in and they destroyed it. Okay. Well, of course, sure, Angela Rache sure. uh, was upset, and uh, I believe that lady's name was Diane Munson, and so they were upset. And they said, wait a minute, that old government can't come in here on our private property and take our drugs. And then the United States Supreme Court didn't even get it yet. It went up to the Federal Court of Appeals in the liberal side of California, and then the Federal Court, the Federal District Court said, you're right. Of they course, of, of course, they're right, they Senator from McCormick. Of course. Well, let's, let me finish yeah, sure. with a question. So, as they went through that analysis, then the uh, district court agreed. Then it went to the federal circuit court in the Ninth Circuit, and they said, "Yeah, you, they, they can't do that to you. You got medical cannabis rights. They can't do that to you." And then the United States Supreme Court said, "Oh, yes, they can. Of course, they can." And they said in six to three opinion, Justice Stevens writing the opinion, Justice Scalia coming in and backing up that opinion, sure. said this, said that under the enumerated powers, the federal government, under the Commerce Clause, interstate and interstate, intrastate and interstate, the federal government has a right through CSA to protect against the growing and carrying on the medical marijuana. They do. I understand they do. They do, but that has nothing to do with the argument about whether or not a state law is, is, is precluded from being enacted. It was shut, it, it it was shut down as against the CSA. What's that? The supremacy of the United States was established in this case, and this is still good law. No, but Senator McCormick, okay, we're, we're, we're talking across purposes here. I acknowledge the supremacy clause in the Constitution. I acknowledge that the Commerce Clause empowers Congress to take action. I don't make the argument that the Controlled Substances Act is unconstitutional. I don't challenge the fact that DEA or federal agents have the right to enforce the, the, the rules of CSA like they did in the case you just said. Okay. What I'm saying is that has nothing to do with the issue of whether or not 
A state medical cannabis law cannot be enacted because it's been preempted. That's a different legal theory you need to explore there. You're, you're mixing apples and oranges. No, I've, I've, I've read this. It basically looked at the California law, which is a medical cannabis law, and said it's trumped. I'm sorry, it's it, Of trumped. course it is. And if there's anything in that law or in any state law that purports to tell the federal government that they can't do what those DE agents did, then that law is invalid because it's violative of the Supremacy Clause. What I'm saying to you is, in the 37 states that have enacted medical cannabis laws, and in this particular legislation, okay. there is nothing in here that provides protection for an individual or a business from having the federal government coming in and saying, this is illegal under federal law and we're going to seize your marijuana. They can do that. They can do that. If we passed a law that said they couldn't do that, then I would agree with you. Then that, then that is something we can't do. Well, this is why I'm, I'm interested in, again, you've cited federal law some 20 some times in your bill. And then you put a provision in here that I thought was very interesting. And I want you to kind of explain what, section, what, sir? what, what you meant uh, by that. By that. Um, it had to do with in the event it was overruled or... Yes, yeah, so at the very... I think it's probably going to be... It's at the very, very end, very uh, end, Senator McCormick, but it was part of the committee amendment. So depending upon what you're looking at, it might be at the very beginning as okay. a committee amendment or if it's in the body of the bill now, it's at the end. Right. And, and what I want to ask you about is, is that you set out... If this happens, then the $15 million that the state of South Carolina has spent getting this set up is just going to evaporate and go away because you said you'll shut it down. Is that correct? That, that language was added, and, and let's just go ahead and read it for the benefit of the body. Go ahead. Um, sections 1 through 8, which is the entirety of the bill, shall be repealed by operation of law if a federal court pursuant to a filing by the United States of America can I, or, stop, can I stop you there? Yes, yeah, sure. Because I want to go through each of these things. You say have to have happen before your bill then is illegal. You would say if a federal court, is the United States Supreme Court a federal court? Of course it is. Okay, and then you said pursuant to a filing by the United States of America and... Or and one of its authorized executive agencies. And was Mr. Gonzalez at that time the Attorney General for, I believe it was President Bush? At, at what time, sir? I'm sorry. At the time that the Gonzalez 2005 case was announced by the United States Supreme Court. I think he was. That was the AG at that time. Mm -hmm. All right or one of its authorized executive agencies, you would agree with me that DEA enforcing an CS, CSA mm -hmm. through Gonzales would, be, would meet that requirement, issues a final order by the federal comprehensive, excuse me, by the federal uh, order, and it said declaring that those sections have been preempted. And so that's the language that you're using. In the analysis between you and Chip Camps, excuse me, the senator from Charleston, did I not hear y'all talk about the issue of preemption back and forth and back and forth about the issue of various types of preemption? I didn't hear you talk about something called obstacle preemption. I did, I did is, talk about obstacle preemption. You did? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That, that falls is, into the subcategory of implied preemption. Which is another type obstacle of... Obstacle and impossibility are the two components of implied. And there appears to be numerous legal opinions on both sides of that. Mm -hmm as to whether or not the medical cannabis law has been preempted. There seems to be various studies both ways by, well, by legal scholars Well, let me, let me to, say this. to that effect. What, what we don't have is a decision by a federal district court striking down a state's medical cannabis laws as being violative of the supremacy clause because Congress has preempted the field. I mean, show me where a state law has been struck down by the federal government arguing that the CSA preempts the field either expressly or impliedly. I'm sure you've read by now, Gonzalez. Yeah, but that, does, that, that case did not involve uh, the federal is, government coming in and shutting down a state medical cannabis law. Did, it, invo did, it involved... Did they not declare, Senator, did yeah. they not declare, and you and I can, you know, we'll, we'll calm down about this, sure. but did not the United States Supreme Court declare that the CSA was superior, supreme to the California medical cannabis Law. Of, co of course it is. And, and that's why. And that's, no, let, let, me, let me finish. You asked me a question. Of course it's supreme right. in, in, into the areas that it speaks. And there's nothing in this bill that prohibits the DEA or any other executive agency of the federal government from coming in 
and enforcing that CSA Schedule One prohibition and seizing the cannabis. Look at that doesn't. There's nothing in here that blocks that. Look in here. Look in here as it talks about the medical cannabis as it relates to possession and cultivation, which is part of the CSA. But here it you got the to United States Supreme Court saying against the, Calif the California law, you can't. You can't possess it. No, no. I, I, you can't I, grow it. I mean, we're in violent agreement here. Okay. okay. There, 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 there is nothing to prevent the federal government, even if this law were to pass. Okay. okay let's assume this law were to pass. Okay. And you got medical cannabis establishments. You've got growers. You got processors. You got dispensers. You got wh whatever. Okay. Okay? There is nothing to prevent, uh, assuming that Congress doesn't continue to keep in this in the budget, saying you can't use the money to do it. Okay. There is nothing to prevent the federal government. Nothing in this law. That would prevent the federal government from coming in and taking your cannabis because you're right. The not, CSA is a federal law. It's the supreme law of the land. Nothing in this bill can constrain or restrict the federal government from enforcing that law. But, but what I would say to you is that hadn't happened in the 37 states primarily because Congress every year says to those federal agencies, you can't use any of the money we give you to do exactly what you're postulating here. So, but your point is well taken. It is the supreme law of the land. The Controlled Substances Act is going to trump this, this law. Yeah. When we talk about, you know, criminal penalties and exemptions, we're talking about in regard to state law. We're not talking about federal law. We don't have any ability to nullify federal law. So as I began the discussion about comedy, as a matter of public policy, do we want to write laws that are completely contrary to the federal law? Well, we did it last year with the heartbeat bill. That's a different issue because that's a fundamental constitutional right. You're not telling me that you think that somehow medical marijuana is a constitutional she right. You didn't phrase your question in those terms. You phrased the question in the terms of, as a matter of comedy, should we be passing a law that's in violation of federal law? That's, that's right. how you phrased your question. That's right. But, I, but the same point. Does two wrong make a right? I'm answering your question about comedy, okay? Okay. And, and, well, and, what, I, and what I would say to you is, in terms of comedy, okay, if it, in fact, was the case that the Controlled Substances Act, either through express preemption or implied preemption in the subcategories of obstacle and impossibility, if it were, in fact, the case, as I think that you're trying to argue, that these state medical cannabis laws were violative of that preemption principle, you would see decision after decision striking down medical cannabis laws in states. There haven't been any. There haven't been any. I haven't seen any lawsuits even brought. And, they, and, and you know why? Because first of all, it is, not, um, it is not prohibited by the preemption doctrine. Second of all, because Congress has said to the Department of Justice and its, and its, and its subsidiary agencies like the DEA, you can't use any of this money we're giving you to challenge state medical cannabis laws. Yeah, if you'll look at that too, I went back and studied that. It's not necessarily what it said. It said we will not use the money to prosecute patients, sir. Uh, we'll read it. I'll read it right now. Go back and, and look okay. at it. I'll call it out to you as well. It talks about, it talks about patients. Here's how it reads. None of the funds made available under four, uh, under four of this act to the Department of Justice may be used with respect to any of the states, and then it lists all of the states, all the states, and then at the very end, it says, to prevent any of them from implementing their own laws that authorize the use, distribution, possession, or cultivation of medical marijuana. I, I'm, I'm, I'm reading it verbatim to you. Okay. Um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to pull any punches. It is what it is. You and I, I, I can tell you this, Senator, you and I will never do that against one another. I'm not that type of lawyer, and I don't believe no, you I don't, are I don't either. suggest that you are, but, but, yeah. I, but, I, but I read that, and it's fairly straightforward. None of the funds made available to the Department of Justice may be used with respect to any of the states, and then it lists all the states that have medical cannabis laws, to prevent any of them, them referring back to the states, what, what from year? implementing their own laws that authorize the use, distribution, possession, or cultivation of medical marijuana. What year are you reading from? I'm reading, it's the, it's the Rohrbacher Farr Amendment that Congress has passed in each budget cycle since 2014, the current one is in connection with the joint res or the continuing resolution that Congress is operating under. I'm looking at Eric Holder's uh, statement, basically of 2009. Eric Holder, being the Obama uh, Attorney General, mm -hmm. who basically said that issued new guidelines allowing for no enforcement of the federal ban in some situations. He basically said it will not be a priority of use of federal resources. It said to prosecute patients. 
What you're confusing, though, Senator McCormick, is the Cole Memorandum, which is what that's referring to. Okay. I'm reading the budget rider that Congress passes. And, and so the 2009 Cole Memorandum that gave prosecutorial discretion or advice to U.S. attorneys, that's not what I'm citing here. That, that Cole Memorandum was withdrawn. But isn't, but isn't that, it, it, that's the reason they stopped doing it in 2009. But let me, let me read to you what their philosophy was as to why. It said, it said it was not a, it not be a priority of the use of federal resources to prosecute patients with serious illnesses or their caregivers who are complying with state laws on medical marijuana, comma, but we will not tolerate drug traffickers who hide behind claims of compliance with state law to mask activities that are clearly illegal. At least that was the public policy of Eric Holder during the Obama administration that he wouldn't, pu he wouldn't punish the patients. But he certainly didn't say that he would not punish grow fields, processing plants, transporters, mm -hmm. dispensaries. Uh, but, but, but again, let's, let's just be clear. Um, when I'm reciting what the prohibition the DOJ is operating under in regard to use of funds, that is the current law. What you're reciting from in 2009 is what's referred to as the Cole Memorandum um, which was advice given to U.S. attorneys. So, so I, I mean, I've, and I've not mentioned the Cole Memorandum in the time that I've been up here at this podium because I wouldn't want to mislead this body into thinking that that was somehow an exposition of what the federal government is saying in regard to state cannabis laws. So, this is a much better, cleaner statement what Congress actually passes every year. Would you agree with me that tomorrow they may do away with that law? They may not put it in the proviso coming up. The, the Senate, I mean, excuse me, the General Assembly of the United States of America may not put that in the budget proviso coming up. I, I guess the, that, that could be, but as a matter of course, well, for, the last eight, for the last eight years, it's just rolled into the bucket. Fine, but let's go, let's talk about what happens. We've got this $15 million of our state money. We're trying to cut taxes and we're trying to cut the size of government. What $15 and million that, dollars are we referring to, sir? Sir? What $15 million are we referring to? The budget impact of this of this medical marijuana? Well, we can talk about that at some point because I think um, the estimate that SLED provided in regard to, and let's, let's get into that because I think it speaks to, to good faith. Um, SLED isn't really required to do much of anything in this bill other than to consult with medical cannabis establishments in regard to security and things of that nature. They say they need 78 new employees establishing two new units. What the heck are they going to do? Are they going? Are they going to drive around? Are they going to go ahead and, and, and surveil every medical cannabis establishment in the state 24/7? Um, but, 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 but bottom line, since we're talking about fiscal impact, mm -hmm. I'll stand by what I said earlier. Okay. There are going to be some upfront costs that this general fund has to take care of to get the program up and running. But every single state that has adopted a medical cannabis law does not. Not, not only is, does it not have to get money from the general fund long-term to cover, it generates surplus revenues because of the economic activity and the revenues that are coming into the sales tax. And I'll stand by that. And we can talk about revenue raising taxes and whether or not that should start in the House or whether that should start in the Senate. Well, let's talk about it now. Another, let's talk about time. it now. I'm not Great prepared. Support. I'm not prepared, Senator. <laughs> and, and I'll be happy to say that I'm not prepared to talk about it uh, on that question. I'll leave that to some others because I'm just not adept. Senator from Darland. Pardon me, inquiry. State your inquiry. So, the, so there's a um, reference as to whether or not that this is a revenue raiser which will start in the House of Representatives. And, but I'm, I'm trying to be certain that there's not a point of order being um, raised. And, and, and the second part of that is, is that, pardon me, inquiry is, is that are we on a, um, an amendment that that address any issue as it relates to tax. We are on the there's there's no been there's been no point of order raised and we're on the explanation of the of the bill. No no amendment. No no amendment. There's no before. there's no point of order. You have raised a point of order. I have not raised a point of order. I guess you know that's the that's senator fine. If right. we want to have that discussion and we want to talk about what the, the what the constitution allows and whether or not the primary purpose of the bill um, you know, can have revenue raisings. I'm, I'm ready to have that argument if you want to have it. The budget office said it's going to cost us $15 million. Would you dis disagree with that? I do disagree with that. Okay. How much does the budget office say that this bill will cost to implement? The fiscal impact that was issued 
is in two components. You have DHEC indicates that it needs an initial expenditures Given the potential for lag in revenue collections, okay, so this talks about initially, DHEC expects to rely on general fund appropriations of $5,034,000 to establish the program in fiscal year 2022-2023. For fiscal year 2023-2024, DHEC indicates that other funds from fees and monetary penalties will fund the expected $3,045,000 recurring appropriations. So, after the first year of operation, DHEC is projecting that the fees and monetary penalties and, and funds of that nature will cover their recurring expenditures. So, and I've, I've been frank up front, there is going to be a, an impact one time uh, to the general fund as this program is stood up before you start having people, you know, using the system and, 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 and establishments operating. Um, where I object, quite frankly, is the state law enforcement indicates the need to establish two new units with 78 FTEs to manage the requirements of the bill. They're not required to do anything. <laughs> I mean, they, they, DHEC is in charge of this program, okay? Now, certainly law enforcement is in charge of making sure that the law is followed. So if you have diversion of medical cannabis for recreational use, if you've got somebody in possession of, a, of a, an, an amount of cannabis that's not allowable under state law, if you have individuals who are consuming medical cannabis in public, which is prohibited by this law, there are any number of instances where if you're in violation of law, like every other law we pass, law enforcement can't arrest them. But to say that you need that many new FTEs in order to discharge the requirements of the bill, they aren't required to do anything. I want to get back to the easier route and talk about the 1980 Therapeutic Act as well as Julian's Law. Now, you did participate in Julian's Law, didn't you? 2014 law. That, that, I drafted that law. So, I mean, again, at that point in time, the General Assembly also was again exercising as a matter of public policy comity between the federal and the, and the state, and y'all were trying to, as I read that, you were trying to get through the three or four different types of epilepsy that, that there was some alleged and there may be now proven uh, benefits of cannabis, cannabis oil or whatever, whatever the product is, THC or CBD, uh, to help with the epileptic circumstances. Fine with that. And again, I'm trying to help you over here with no, people, I, I appreciate people this, that everyone. really need it. I'm with you. Okay. Now, let's take it a step further. Okay. Now, you're talking about doing this in small steps. You use the word, I want to do this in small steps. Senator... 15 grow fields? Excuse me? 15 grow fields? Yes, 15 grow fields. Where did that number come from? Um, I've looked at what other states have authorized in terms of the number of establishments, growers, processors, uh, dispensers. I've looked at the population in those states and tried to correlate it downward to conform with our population. So I tried to, I tried to define a relatively narrow universe of medical cannabis establishments, and unlike, quite frankly, Senator McCormick, other states have not, some states have not put any restrictions at all. It's just the Wild West. You file your application, you get out there and you do a grow. So I'm I not thought, asking about other states. But I'm, I'm not but worried about What I'm about telling that. you is why I'm saying it's conservative. Our, states, our state limits it, and I don't think 15 is a huge number of grow facilities. I mean, maybe you and I disagree about 15. How, how large are these grow facilities? How large I don't know. Are, how I mean, many acres? I, I don't know. It depends on the applicant and what's approved by DHEC and the capital that they have and what their business plan is. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't get into the micromanaging of that. Are you aware that in Florida they had eight and they're trying to reduce the number of grow fields from eight and here we are in South Carolina asking for 15? Certainly there's a lot more people in Florida than there are in South Carolina wanting to use medical cannabis. In, in looking at the, the other states, I consider 15 uh, cultivating facilities to be a very modest number. All right. And let's move on to the next thing. You, you said we need 30 processors. So I'm assuming those, why do you need 30 processors? Again, I'm looking at what establishments, the markets are doing in other states. Okay, I'm looking, we have experience of being able to look and see how this, let me finish my answer. We have the advantage of looking at what those states have actually done, how it's worked. 
you know, what have been the ratio of grow facilities to processing facilities to dispensaries. And so I have tried to look at what other states have done to look at what has worked efficiently and then extrapolate that back into our state, accounting for adjustments in population. That's how I came up with those numbers. Now, if there are different numbers that you think are better or that you think are, are, are more manageable or you think there's a more of a rational relationship between those numbers and, and the population of South Carolina, let's put up the amendment and let's debate it. I'm telling you how I got to these numbers. Okay, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And then, as it relates to these processing plants, you got—I guess you got two for one for every grow field. You got two processing plants. Is that where you got the 30 number? Is the 15 times 30 uh, is, is why, two, uh, times two is 30. Two yes. per probably. Okay, to get to the 30. 15 times two is 30. Okay. Yes. And then you've got the transporter circumstance, where I'm assuming that we're talking about a lot of cash and a lot of dope and protecting that in some way to get it from point A to point B. I wouldn't call it dope, sir. It's, it's medicine, okay? For, for her, it's medicine. The ones I'm worried about over here, Cheech and Chong, is dope. All right, let's, let's explore that for a moment. Okay. Cheech and Chong. Okay. They like to get high, or they used to. I don't I, know if they do anymore. I would anymore. say for sure I don't know they, they like to get high. So a lot of people smoke dope, right. all right? They go out there, they buy marijuana, roll it in a joint, smoke it in a bong. You know, they, they smoke it, okay? If you're that person, if you're that person, why in the world, instead of going out and buying cannabis for your personal consumption, which will be a misdemeanor, why would you instead go through this process, lie to a physician, uh, commit a felony um, to purchase something that's much more expensive than what you could buy on the street? I mean, what rational actor would pay more for something and subject themselves to a felony? I, I just, I, it, doesn't, it, you, it doesn't hold up. I'll tell you a quick story. Okay. I was uh, defending a fellow who was charged with murder, and one of these other fellows that were with him was also charged with murder, and they were charged with aiding and abetting one another and killing this fellow at McDonald's. And he got up on the stand, and I asked him, had he had any drugs? And he said, well, yes. I said, well, what kind of drugs did you have? And he said, well, I had a blunt. And, of course, I'd never even heard of a blunt. So I'm in, the, I'm in the middle of a, a, a trial of a case. I think uh, I had a judge out of Greenville was, was there, tough judge. Anyway, this guy gets to there and he explains this blunt situation. I said, well, what is it? He said, well, you take a cigar and you split it down the middle and you take all the tobacco out of it and then you put the marijuana in it, okay? And then you close it up and you smoke that and that's a blunt. He said, well, they smoke several blunts along with cocaine and all that before all this happened. So that was why you couldn't remember all what happened. So that was my first introduction to Blunt. So let's get back to, to Cheech and Chong for just a minute. Sure. Those folks are the folks that I'm worried about. And here's what happens. I have practiced criminal law for 39 years. I've represented so many people, so many people charged with marijuana and these mandatory minimums. And I'll talk to you a little bit about your bill here as well. And, you know, these people... They're going to smoke their dope. And what they're going to do with this dope, if you let that group, Teach and Chong, not only, you know, your earlier bill, and I understand y'all have changed that now, allowed people from out of state to come to South Carolina with a medical cannabis card and get marijuana in, in South Carolina. And we had reciprocity, I believe, where our people could go to other states and get marijuana, right? That, that was in the bill, but as you rightly note, that is something that, you know, in an effort, continuing effort to be constructive and responsive to express concerns. I have, thank have you for that. And I've got a little concern about that under full faith and credit from state to state, to be honest with you, from a, again, from a constitutional point of view. But that's something I guess it could be could looked at and, and dealt with. But what's going to happen is these people are going to take these blunts. And they're going to take this THC that's at such high concentrations that, yeah, it costs more, but it's substantially much stronger, much stronger than the little 2 or 3% that they've got. And they're going to take that oil and they're going to put it over that marijuana cigarette. Blunt. I, maybe. Maybe. I mean, I, I, I don't I, do I, it, so I wouldn't have a clue. Yeah. But I, I listened to what he said and I wrote it down and I watched it. So what I'm concerned about is whether they're vaping it, you know, if they get a hold of it illegally, improperly, then those people, you know, this is a lot bigger footprint. I'm worried that this is a basis to bring recreational marijuana 
South Carolina. What you said, it's not your intention, and I believe you, but I believe your small step is so large that there's another way. There's another way here in our existing law if we modify it, we add your people, Ms. Richardson, and every class of person that needs to be, go here, and then we try to help them with medical cannabis. And we follow the federal rules and regulations. There is an easy way to get a clinical study done. I, respect, yep. I respectfully disagree with you, sir. Okay, well, let me ask you this. What really concerns me also, is that the doctor doesn't even have to participate in a study. It says may. Participate in what study, sir? In any study. I mean, I thought we were doing this to learn science, to be able to help people. So are you suggesting this bill should be amended to constrict doctors into, into, into participating in studies against their will? At, well, why would it be against their will if they're trying to help Ms. Richardson? Well, we can require them to do certain things in terms of continuing med medical education because I think that relates to their qualifications, but I don't think that we can compel them to participate in studies. I mean, we can have a discussion about what baseline of knowledge you want physicians to have in order to be an authorizer. I would suggest to you that compelling them or conscripting them to go into and participating into some unnamed study really isn't something we want to do. Well, and then you don't even have these patients part of the study. Why is it required that every patient who's going to receive medical cannabis be made to be part of a study so we can see the efficacy of your brainchild? I mean, I really want to see it happen. I really want to see us find 15 things that it solves. Council, I really do. Yeah, I, I, and there's a way of doing that, but you got to do it with controlled studies and the federal government has got a method for us to be, follow to be able to do that lawfully. You know, and we don't, we don't make everybody criminal. They, they don't, sir, because if, if that were the case, you wouldn't have 37 states to set up a medical cannabis law, okay? They'd be doing what you're suggesting, which is not possible. Well, in Julian's law, tell us about that. When, did you in Julian's push law, what, what we did was um, we recognized that individuals with epilepsy were responsive to cannabis treatment, uh, particularly cannabis that was heavy in the CBD strain as opposed to the THC strain. And what we did in that particular law is that we allowed a, a doctor to authorize an epilepsy patient to consume cannabis as long as it didn't have more than 0.9% THC in it. That's what we did in that particular law. Okay. And, and did we do any studies on that? I'm sorry, sir? Any studies on that? Were any studies, clinical studies done in the area of this epilepsy in Julian's law? Not mandated by that law. Uh, there may have been studies done by MUSC or by USC School of Medicine or, or other that I'm unaware of, but I guess to your point, there's nothing in that 2014 law that compelled participation by those epilepsy patients in studies. Is, is that the question? Yes. No, there's nothing in the law that compels that. Well, don't you think it would be very helpful to all of us, if we're going to spend money on it, that we ought to get the University of South Carolina, all these research institutes, let's get them involved in this. And let's set up clinical studies. And if you want to get into the medical marijuana field, fine. You got to, you got to go through and, and sign up for the study. And then if you have one of these maladies, whatever it may be, suppose it's chronic pain. Well, fine. You know, you've been using opioids. I've heard your arguments about opioids versus cannabis. Okay. And I'll tell you about that in just a minute. But as it relates to that, I mean, these people that are, are using it, you know, they need to be able to say how they're feeling. If it's subjective, it's not objective, it's subjective as to how they're feeling. How are we going to know, how are we going to help the doctors know, the physicians, the, the pharmacists know, as to what quantity we give these people for those 14 days. Well, presumably the physician and the patient are gonna discuss that. Presumably the pharmacist is gonna discuss that with the patient. I don't know how you get to the result that you, you're articulating there by having them participate in a study, okay? And, and, and to the point of studies, there are hundreds of peer-reviewed scientific studies out there taking place throughout this country. So, so the notion that somehow doctors and physicians don't have access to peer-reviewed studies to understand what the efficaciousness of cannabis can be for medicine isn't true. 
that there are lots of studies out there. I, I, I have I've, several of them I've in my got, binder. I've got a lot of studies on the reverse side of it. You well, and, and I both. And, and, and I know that book. You and, and I. And that book makes a valid point. Okay. And, and the point that he makes in that book, okay, the point he makes in that book is that for individuals who are disposed to have schizophrenia or disposed to, to psychological problems, they ought not have cannabis because there are demonstrated instances where, if they are, it can translate itself into violence. I, I, I readily admit that. And, and that's one of the reasons why it's so important for that patient uh, doctor uh, diagnosis to review somebody's mental history. Do they have a history of that? Because the, bo the book points out, and quite frankly, that book rightly points out that many states don't have what we have in this bill. Many of these states simply say, you can go out there and grow your own. You go out and grow your own marijuana. There's no physician involvement in the consumption of cannabis in a lot of those states. But what I'm saying is, let's look at our law. Let's look at what our law requires. Okay. Let's talk about this okay. then a little bit. Okay. I'm with you on your law, sure. okay? Let's talk about your law. Okay. Now, I'm talking about making everybody, both the doctors who participate in these studies, as well as the pharmacists, as well as these patients, to participate in these studies. Now, suppose, you know, you're calling this compassionate care, and when we look at her, I'm with you. I'm not with you, Cheech and Chong. Talking about compassionate care, I'm there. So if, if these people, I can't believe that Ms. Richardson would not want to participate in a study and help others with her malady and as to how, how cannabis has helped her and let her explain and let her journal about how this is working for her. And all of that, all of that information gets, gets put together. Now, suppose we I, get I, one I, of these kids. Let's just okay, okay, but can I respond to that about yeah. what Ms. Richardson yeah. might do? Yes. But, but it's up to her whether or not she wants to do that. Some individuals might not be comfortable doing that, Senator from McCormick. And, 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 and I don't know why, in a bill that seeks to empower patients and, and physicians, we have to include in there a requirement that the patient somehow participate in the study. Well, because there's a lot of argument as to whether or not there are a lot of help from medical cannabis. I mean, there's studies both ways. Listen, I've, I've seen them. You've seen them. And, 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 and I would you agree with them. you. I would agree with you. And, and I suspect we're going to hear some of them. I am not saying marijuana is a panacea. You I am not that. saying marijuana can solve all these conditions. Right. All I'm doing is saying that when that physician sits down with a patient, I would like this to be one of the options they discuss. It's up to that physician to decide whether it's appropriate for that patient to avoid the things that are chronicled in that book. Let's talk about that, your, your bill calls for and it, it, it's interesting if the person is under uh, 25 to 18, I think it takes two physicians to participate. I didn't see anything in there from 18 down to, you know, whatever, you know, and I'm assuming that there are patients out there who will need to have a doctor's prescription for that as well. I'm sorry, sir, for under for, 18? Yeah, for under 18. Yes, you know, the, guardian, the guardian would be the one that, that um, is, would be the authorized caregiver in that instance. Okay. And, you know, th there's a lot of stuff in here, a lot of work about guardians, and we, we can talk about that. There's a host of things that we can talk about. But I'm worried about this kid. He's shown no signs of any psychiatric, no psychosis, no schizophrenia. Smokes dope. In that case, it's dope, as far as I'm concerned. Now, if it's medical marijuana, and if it's measured out, and if the doctor's part of the study, and if the patient is part of the study, and if the pharmacist is part of the study, and we're all going to have all this information shared, you know, with the university, then in six months, but what happens if he has an episode in, in two weeks? What happens if he goes, you know, schizophrenic as possibility based upon this, these studies? I'm, I'm never going to say to this body, um, that there can't be an adverse consequence to taking marijuana. I'm never gonna say to this body, there aren't gonna be cases where physicians misdiagnose. Um, what I will say, however, is whenever you're talking about public policy and deciding whether to do something, you weigh the instances where there can be bad outcomes against the benefits that accrue. We do that all the time. We do those trade-offs all the time. And, and so what I would say is that the likelihood or instances where there's going to be the reactions that you're talking about, okay? Which is uh, maybe as it, much it, as 20, 30 percent. 
No, it's not. It's one. It's well. I, I can show you some peer-reviewed studies that talk about a one percent reaction I'm just to those things. Relying upon this. Well, you know, that's a mystery writer. Okay, he writes mysteries. Um, and and he did um, a pretty good job on this. I mean, you acknowledge he, 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 he made a lot of money on this thing. Good. Okay. Um, but what I'm saying is, what we're doing as policymakers is we're weighing the benefits that would accrue to people under this bill. Okay. And you're properly pointing out, and I, I, fair enough, what some of those costs might be. Right. And what you're articulating, it's fair enough for us to consider. Let's factor that in. In the weighing process, and I concede to you, there are going to be cases where individuals are authorized to get cannabis and should not be. I mean, for me to stand up here and say with 100% certainty that that would never occur, that, wouldn't be, uh, that would be disingenuous on my part. So I, I don't dispute that. Well, help me get there. Help me keep these Cheech and Chongs who have a headache, those Cheech and Chongs who have insomnia, those Cheech and Chongs who say, and I got pain. You know, I got pain, brother. Senator McCormick, there is marijuana out there now. I'm not talking that about getting. that. We're not talking about the Garden of Eden and introducing the serpent into it. Okay, it's out there now, and they're right. smoking it. Right. Oh, okay. I, and, look. And, and look, and and, and again, and, I, and I'll just say it again, and I won't. I won't anymore. It doesn't make any sense for somebody who wants to get high, a Cheech and Chong, who's going out there buying marijuana very easily, getting what he wants. It doesn't make any sense instead for them to say, well, wait a minute, here's a good idea. Instead, why don't I try to go ahead and commit fraud and participate in a medical cannabis program and subject myself to a felony penalty where I can be in prison for five years to get something that's going to cost me a lot more than what I can buy down that street? It doesn't make any sense to me. Right. And at some point in time, we have to make a judgment call in this body as to what is feasible and what isn't. I don't think that's feasible. Well, again, all I can say is, is that I represented thousands of people over the years, and, and, and a lot of them went to jail. Yeah, they and smoked a lot dope. of these people. They, and they, they, you're making and, my point. They buy marijuana. And they, will, and they will still do that. All I'm saying is, this lady right here, if she bought it, it was because she had to. She didn't have a choice. I'm opening that door for those people. I, and I'm I appreciate good with that. that. I appreciate that. I'm closing that door. I don't want that door we, open either, we, Senator Well, McCormick. then let's work together and figure out a way to make sure we close that door. And one of the ways to do that is to have everybody participating in our studies. Let's be the, let's, instead of talking about us, you know, well, maybe it's right, maybe it'll work, maybe. Why don't we have exacting no, no, studies? No, no, We've no. got the greatest universities no. in, the, in the world, as I, far as I'm concerned, right here. Let me stop. I am not saying maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. What I'm saying is, that decision is being made at the wrong level right now. That needs to be decided by a doctor. It doesn't need to be decided by us. Uh -huh. I want to get us out of the medicine business and put it in the hands of a doctor where it belongs. Well, and, and, and to that point, again, we get back to this federal thing. It is, there's a United States Supreme Court saying that a physician cannot prescribe this medic, marijuana because it's illegal. So, I mean, you, you want to you, you talk about that for a little bit? Well, you know why this is so difficult? You know why we're having to go all the way around our toe to get to our eye is because we're dealing with a federally illegal substance, and there's a lot of us. My oath of office, you had made a comment about my saying that. When I read a Supreme Court opinion that says that it's not proper, I'm, Sir, I'm bound by, you know. Sir, when, when the Supreme Court case you're referring to is in regard to the Supremacy Clause, and based on the facts you gave me, involved DEA agents flying over, seeing marijuana, and going down and seizing that marijuana. Yeah. That is perfectly appropriate. There's nothing in this law that would prevent the federal government from doing the very same thing here in South Carolina. Now, in regard to it being illegal, since, you know, we're citing cases, yeah. the U.S. Court of Appeals, a federal uh, Court of Appeals, Ninth Circuit, and Conant versus Walters said that a physician had the authority to authorize a patient's use of medical cannabis, that that was not illegal on the Controlled Substances Act. Federal Circuit Court of Appeals decision. Um, again, Conant, C-O-N-A-N-T versus States Walters. Did it go to the United States Supreme Court? It was not appealed uh, to the Supreme Court. Okay. Or they didn't grant cert to one side or the other. There, there's no Supreme Court case. I don't know whether they petitioned yeah, for cert or not. Liberal, and, you know, that's where this Gonzalez case came from. Please use, please use your Apologize. mic. Apologize. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> that's, that's where that came from. You know, the Gonzalez case came out of that same Ninth Circuit. So, again, you've got a bunch of liberal judges, in my estimation, who are not following the law. You know, they did the same thing with immigration. 
And maybe we're, maybe we're to the point where none of us want to follow the law and not be alone, no longer as a matter of public policy, want to be a rule of law state. If you want to have a conversation about what the proper role of state and society is, we can have that. But I would suggest to you the position that you're taking with the state controlling and stepping into the physician-patient relationship, that's the very definition of statism. I'm not, I'm not saying that, look, I want a doctor to prescribe this for her, and I want a pharmacist like our good pharmacist there to fill it. And how do we get there? And how do we get there without violating federal law? How do we get there to that point? And whether we need one growth field or whether we need a thousand, I want to make sure that those people are taken care of, but I don't want those folks over there. Senator, to Senator McCormick, you can't just make a statement saying that a medical cannabis law is violative of federal law without showing me a case I where it's been did, struck Gonzales. down. No, no, you didn't try to show me a case tracking down a medical cannabis law. You showed me a case where an individual said a state law provides me protection from federal prosecution, and it doesn't. Neither does this law. That's the case you cited to me. Well, that case said as a matter of the supremacy clause under, you know, it was talking about what? It was talking about the right of the, of the state and the federal government. So it was a conflict, jurisdiction, it was there. It was one state versus the United States in that, in that issue. And it was under the race in her, in her and, name. And I agree with you. If there's something in a state law that purports to stop a federal government from enforcing the Controlled Substances Act, I agree. Strike it down. The Supremacy Clause says you can't do that. What I'm saying to you is, I'm talking about this law. I'm not talking about that case. I'm talking about our law, and there's nothing in this law that violates the preemption doctrine. There's nothing in this law that prohibits the federal government from enforcing the CSA. Well, in, in fact, the... The United States can come in and, and prosecute everybody involved in this. Of course they can. Well, with this we, restriction. We put them in well, wait, 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 wait. With this restriction. Not so long as that budget proviso is in there, because that budget proviso is very express what in, happens, regard to, in regard to what they can spend, use the money appropriated to them for. What happens if we get a Richard Nixon back in office? God forbid. Suppose we get a Jeff Sessions as Attorney General. And then he looks around and says, you know, I'm sick and tired of the United States of America and all of these people in these courts and whatnot not following the law. I'm going to go ahead and fix that border. I'm going to fix this abortion issue. I'm going to fix that gun issue. I'm going to reach over here and I'm going to fix this issue. And we're going to follow the federal law that has been preempted. We're going to follow that. And that's what we're going to do. Okay? And if they did that, where have you left South Carolinians, Senator? If they did that, then every single state that has a medical cannabis law and, and every single medical cannabis establishment in those 37 states and, and the more than 75% of the, of the United States population that is accessing that medical cannabis, they'd be angry, okay? What I'm going to suggest to you is what you're postulating... That's, that's Article 5 stuff. But, but what, you're, what you're postulating is, 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 is politically, you know, fantastical. I mean, if they were going to do that, why haven't they done it? Why Listen. haven't they done it? You've had eight years of a Mr. Obama and Mr. Holder. Now we've had years of you, George Bush and a, Donald Trump. I mean, after it's, it's, that, and Gonzalez was pursuing it. But Look that wasn't again, sir. It wasn't against a medical cannabis law. It wasn't against. Did it? It wasn't. Mention? It wasn't in regard to a law. I mean, we're not talking about a law that purports to block federal action. If that law did, if California or whatever that state is, it did that. If they had in their law that this is going to shield you from the DEA from enforcing the CSA, you're damn right that's going to get struck down because it's violative of the Supremacy Clause. But that's not what we're doing here. You, you can't take a case like that and apply it here. I, I, I hate to say that the, the United States Supreme Court has made it very clear that the cannabis law, the medical marijuana law of California, has been trumped by the supremacy clause of the federal court and CSA. Of course I'm it sorry, is. It's, it's here. I no, can't, of course, of course I can't change is. the words. We're, again, we're in violent agreement here, okay? I, I'm not, if, if, if this law were to say somehow that we're passing this law and we're going to tell South Carolinians you're shielded now from the federal government enforcing the CSA, I would say you're right. That is not what this does. There's nothing in this law that prohibits the federal government from enforcing the CSA. So you're going to expose... Every South Carolinian, we're going to expose every South Carolinian who participates in this that we know is a violation of federal law. 
That's what your intentions are here? Yes. All right. So and that's what me, the intentions me, are in the 37 states that have done this. I'm not worried about those 37 states. Backed, up, backed up by Congress every year saying to the, federal, to the DOJ, you can't enforce this law against these medical. They've acted. They've acted. They've already green-lighted this. If you've got enough states, then you go to an Article 5 convention okay. and you make it legal. Okay? Right. Fine. That's, that's a separate well, we're discussion. We're just going to have to agree to disagree on this, Senator. It's a separate moment. day. Let me, let me mention this to you. You know, I heard you say that, you know, um, Cannabis uh, is not addictive. Did I hear you say that? Do I think marijuana is addictive? Yes. I don't think it's physically addictive in the way that opiates are. I guess somebody could be, in, in some instances, people might have a vulnerability to it, and, and perhaps they, they become psychologically addicted to it, or they just they like that so much. I mean, I'm not saying that can't happen. I don't think in terms of addiction, it's the same sort of addiction you're talking about with opiates or opioids. Or alcohol. Or alcohol. Yeah. 49 people in Greenwood, according to my coroner, died last year of drug overdoses. 15 of those people had marijuana in their system. Now, here's my question. Do you think they started off with heroin before they ever smoked their first marijuana cigarette? Or do you think they started off with cocaine before they smoked their first marijuana so, cigarette? So, um, in the case you're talking about, in the opioid deaths, in 15 of those cases, there was both marijuana and opiates? In every what, case, fentanyl. Okay. So, uh, so, what, so what was it that killed them? Was it the marijuana? No, the marijuana didn't kill them. That's, didn't kill that's them. not the point. I'm not saying marijuana will kill you. I mean, look, it's like the secondhand smoke. Cigarettes will kill you. It's going to give you heart disease, and it's going to kill you in the long term. Uh, the studies haven't been out yet on, on medical marijuana, so we don't know the ends, ends of that, ins and outs of that. I know you're going with the vaping system because you did away with the smoking. Smart move. Again, you know, I, I'm willing to help her. I want to get you there, but I, I just cannot open this door and allow everybody and his brother, do we really need 15 growth fields, Senator? I, I'm scared I, to death of that. I, I respect your point of view, Senator. We, we just disagree on this. Okay, that's fine. Um, I'm, I'm ready to kind of go through your bill. Um, okay. We're ready for that. Sure. I guess yes, sir. We probably need to talk to the to the leaders and see what they want us to do. I'm I'm happy to do whatever they want to do. Senator from Senator, you continue with your questions, correct? Yes. Senator Senator McCormick. I am McCormick. continuing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So he's he's questioning him at this sure. is this point. I yield to my so, friend from so, Thank you. So we'll continue. And I thank you for the courtesy that you provided me answering these questions for us. Um, you would agree with me if we do, do we have to call this compassionate care? I mean, I'm okay calling it compassionate care for this side, but I'm, I'm not really ready to call that compassionate care for that side. For that side being the Cheech and Chong? Yeah, that group. Um, I guess what I would say to you, Senator, and, and maybe we're going to disagree on this, is that those that want to smoke it illegally have access now. This is providing access for individuals who don't want to break the law and don't want to possess it illegally. So this bill is designed to appeal to them. I'll wait for. Okay. All right. Um, compassionate care. Do you agree with me if even one of these kids die that we've talked about here and has an episode, a psychiatric episode, and dies? Um, from a psychiatric episode or whatever, that, that for that family, that's not going to be a compassionate care circumstance. I, w I would agree that that would not be compassionate. Those people are going to suffer. They would. Okay. And so, and, and or if any of these children ages 18 to 25, while their brains are still developing, and you would agree with that, would you not, that the brains are still developing and I, marijuana I, has been deemed to be dangerous to the 18 to 25 year old period people that, and I had that conversation with the senator from Charleston as to um, if and this is my reasoning uh, whether you agree with it or not I, but this is my reasoning that before you reach the age of majority okay uh, at 18 there's parental involvement so there's some sort of a check and balance on the access to medical cannabis in that window of time between 18 when you reach the major age of majority and 25 we felt like 
that there was a, a, a rational basis that, that of treating them differently by requiring two certifications because of the unique position those individuals are in as opposed to individuals older. Um, you know what? We could strike that out if you want to. Okay, if there's so serious concerns, I think it withstands equal protection analysis. But if there is concerns by this body about equal protection treatment here, we can take that out. That's the reasoning for putting that in there. Sir, taking out those 18 to 25s, I'm desperately worried about that group. My son was in that group. Okay. Yes, sir. And 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 he, you know, you can say it's not a gateway drug. I know it is, Senator. And so all I'm saying is, is that. You know, let's make sure that it is a Compassionate Care Act. I like the idea of, of having comedy with our federal brothers and making sure that whatever we do, if we can, is to make sure that our laws mesh. But Senator, I guess I would say this. Can you point to any indication where the federal government believes that the states aren't acting in terms of comedy and passing these medical cannabis laws? Because I think there's evidence of the contrary. Otherwise, they wouldn't be passing this budget proviso saying they can stand. Well, you know, num it's, the law is the law, okay? So, I mean, I'm, I'm all about following the law. I mean, my oath says that, you know, when you look at the Supremacy Clause, it says that state legislators and state judges are under a constitutional requirement to follow the law as, as it is written. So I, I want to be that completely. I don't want to change that or in any way. And, and so whether the federal government is doing their job in enforcing it Senator, I know that those, uh, the CSA is on the books, just like our law is on the books. And, and I've done the best job I could, Senator McCormick, from explaining how there's no express preemption in the CSA and how there's no implied preemption either. So I, I've done my best to try to explain why I think it's not filed to a federal law. Right. You and I disagree on that. I, I respect that. Thank you, Senator. That's all right. Senator from Spartanburg. Senator Martin, what purpose do you rise, sir? See if the Senator from Beaufort would yield for some questions. Senator Yields. Senator Yields. Senator, are you aware that I promised you that I would read every page of this bill? As with any other piece of legislation, you come to your own mind after reading it in its entirety. And, and, um, and you were frank with me early on saying you hadn't really engaged on this yet and that you looked forward to engaging and reading it. And, um, and, and I know that's what you do. Thank you. And um, if you'll entertain me with some questions, I was going through it. Um, I think the first 23, 22 pages, or, or did you know the first 20 something pages of this bill would probably make anybody that was wanting to use this for something, anything other than trying to get help for somebody like Ms. Richards, it would make it very difficult. Did you know I believe that? Uh, not only very difficult, um, very expensive, and subjecting yourself to a felony if, if you were misrepresenting or, or diverting it for recreational use. And again, I respect the Senator from McCormick. He and I just simply disagree as to what a rational actor would do in that context. Right. So on page 23, um, it's talking about, I guess, in section 4453-2190, uh, subsection B, no person or entity may have access to information contained in the department's verification system except for authorized employees. I, I think, and we may need to work on amendment there, that's the first thing that gave me pause in this bill was I believe, did you know, there needs to be a record of exactly who accesses this information and what information they access. Do, do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, and it also, if you continue on reading, it's an employee of the department in the course of his official duties or a state or local law enforcement officer in the course of his official duties related to a person who claims to be a qualifying patient. So, I mean, what, what we attempted to do here was recognize that a lot of this information is, is private. It's 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 medical. It's 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 you know you got HIPAA concerns. So so we limited the access that law enforcement would have to whether or not one is a participant in the program. That that's all they're able to determine. They can't determine the conditions for which it's used. They can't they they can't have access to any of those things. That would be in the privity of physician patients. So an employee or a law enforcement agent just couldn't go thumbing through this for no reason. No. Okay. I mean, uh, no. All right, that, that's what I wanted to make sure of. Scroll on over. I did find one Scrivener's error, but I, I didn't write that down. I didn't have my pen out at the time, but we'll get there. Um, <clears throat> now I'm looking over on page 30, section 44-53-2260. Let me, let 
Let me get it to real quick here. Okay. Okay, I got you. Subsection C. Nothing in this article requires an employer to make any accommodation for the use of medical cannabis products on the property or premises or place of employment. I guess, and it, then it goes on in there to talk about this article in no way limits an employer ability to discipline or terminate an employee for being under the influence of medical cannabis products. The only thing I wrote out to the side of these sections are what about opioids? I mean, don't, don't people get under the influence of opioids right now? They could go to work and cause problems? They could. What, what this attempts to get at, Senator from Spartanburg, is, is and we've had, we've had the debate somewhat in the context, um, well, this is what we're attempting to get at here. Um, does the right of an individual um, to access cannabis as medicine trump an employer's right to have a, a drug-free workplace if it wanted to? And where we came down in this bill is on the side of the employer and their ability to define the workplace environment that they wanted. Um, it is possible to make a rational case for the proposition that this is medicine and it ought not be something that somebody's denied access to. I get that. Um, in passing this bill, there's always trade-offs, and, and you try to balance the rights of individuals against the right of an employer, and that's where we came down here. Okay, so you feel pretty good about that section. I, 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 I feel. Um, well, as good as you can about as it. As good as I can about it. Okay. I mean, I, look, I, I recognize. I mean, the Chamber of Commerce was the one that requested this, and I wanted to get the buy-in of the business community because any bill of this magnitude is going to have to have buy-in by a lot of stakeholder groups, which, which is why, you know. Sitting down with law enforcement, even though they were opposed to the bill, I wanted to know what their primary concerns were. Sitting down with the medical association, sitting down with the faith community, sitting down with, with any group that wants to be heard on this. I tried to figure out what their concerns are, and I tried to weigh them and address them in the bill. Okay. I'm going to move over one more page to page 31, section 45, um, excuse me, section 44-53-2265. dash dash that's where it talks about nothing in the article shall require an employer to permit, et cetera, et cetera. Um, doesn't affect the ability of them to enforce a drug-free workplace that you mentioned. Right. My question is, by that wording, they can allow this, correct? So that employer could allow this yes. if they wanted to. There's nothing that prevents that, no, right? No, no, okay. of course not. That's correct. All right. And, and I would add, most, I think most employers probably would allow it, but, but again, recognizing here that there may be some employers who don't. We, we, we sided on the side of employers here as opposed to the individual. Okay, thank you. Let me scroll over to my next questions. Okay, had to go all the way to page 52. I guess what section page is that, 52, Senator? let me go back. I think the section number's on page 53. Section 44-53-2480. Okay, got it. Object number four, um, where it talks about unlawful user of a controlled substance. Right. Does this apply to illegal opioid use, like the people that buy the opioids off the street? Yes. That still applies to that, right? Yes. Okay. And, Senator, that was the only questions that I wrote down after reading this bill, like I promised you, except for the one I didn't write down was the one I talked to you about. Are you aware that I have an amendment coming to deal with my concerns on the vaping? Yes. Okay. Senator, I appreciate, and I'll take the podium on my amendments at the appropriate time, but thank you for answering my questions. I've got the senator from. Um, I'll, I'll yield to whomever. So he, he's been for a while, and I'll come back to you. Senator McLaren. President and uh, Senator from Orvi, I only have one question, so you can keep standing. Um, I want to see if the senator will yield for one question. Senator Yields. Thank you, Senator. Um, throughout this debate, I've heard, um, I think I heard correctly, a lot of discussion about uh, the medical marijuana, your bill, and, and I think you were saying that. Right now, people are being forced uh, to buy marijuana illegally, and it's cheaper. But with your bill, they can buy it uh, legally, but
but it would be more expensive. I think that's the kind of concept I heard about the cost of the, the different costs of the marijuana. I think, and, and, and again, I'm not in the business, medical cannabis business, but anytime you've got a product that's got to go to the degree of quality control uh, and testing uh, and packaging, um, it's, it's obviously got a lot more overhead costs associated with cost of goods sold than somebody on the street who's selling you a dime bag. So, so the one question I have is that um, if medical marijuana uh, is going to cure or at least ease symptoms for so many uh, major illnesses, cancer, uh, extreme pain, uh, those types of things, so how, how do poor people afford this? I don't, if this passes, I don't want this to be something that will only benefit uh, folks who have means and who have resources because there are a lot of people uh, who are pretty much poor that also suffer these same uh, ailments. And so I'm just wondering, um, uh, you know, how will they afford? I mean, it, it, it seems like, uh, if you agree with me, that maybe they'll be forced to still buy their marijuana from the kid on the corner or something like that um, because of the difference in the price. All I can tell you is the way we set up the financing mechanism here, Senator, was only those fees and, and, and taxes would be levied that were sufficient to administer the program. It was not intended to generate revenues for the general fund for the very reason that you're saying. I, I don't want to price this out of the ability of patients to access medicine. Um, I, I take your point. I mean, it's not going to be covered by insurance, okay? Um, and um, if, if there is something constructive that you would want to propose in regard to um, assisting individuals of, mean, uh, of, of lesser means, to access the medical cannabis, I think that'd be a worthwhile thing to consider. But I can tell you that I'm mindful of that, and that's why in setting up this fee structure in here, it was only to cover the cost of administering, because I wanted to keep it down as low as we could. Thank you, I just, just caught that, and I said, well, you know, if this passes, then you know, based on what I'm hearing, poor people still will not have access to it, most likely, but I thank you for answering my question. Yes, sir. Senator Maury, Senator Amber, what purpose do you ask? Thank you, Mr. President, to see if the Senator from Buford would yield for a few questions. Se yes. Senator, yields for questions. Thank you, and, and Senator Davis, I, I hope you know and, uh, and, under, and believe that I truly, I genuinely appreciate your patience with the questions. It's a complicated bill, and you've been exceedingly patient, and I, and I greatly appreciate, I, I hope you know, the uh, continued patience you have with the questions that I'm about to, to serve yeah, up. I get the sinking feeling that that's a preamble you give to somebody you're going to destroy on cross, right? <laughs> as, you, as, as you know, as a lawyer, when the judge uh, starts out saying how good a lawyer the defendant has right before sentencing, that's a bad day for the defendant. <laughs> but truly, uh, the questions I have are, are fairly confined, so I, I, I don't sure. expect to be... Um, uh, keep you up there with my questions for very long. Do the best uh, I can. Couple of subjects that I want to I want to touch on because I'm just more than anything else a little confused as I've repeatedly uh, studied on the bill, and I want to I want to first talk about the revenue that is generated by this article by this by this bill and this proposal. As I understand, it creates on page I'm going to go to in 4453-2020 20, 20, section A. I'm sorry, sir. Which one? I'm sorry. 4453-2020 24, 20, 20, A. 2020 A. Sorry, let me get to it real quick. Sure. Section 44-5320, I'm sorry, 20, 2020A. 2020A. I'm sorry, I went to the wrong section. Do you know what page that's on, Senator? I'm just... Uh, on my, uh, Senator, on my copy of the bill, it's page 8, okay. but I'm not... Okay. Uh, I'm not sure which. Okay, I got it. I got it now. Yes, sir. So, as I understand, the, the DHEC under Section 8 would establish a South Carolina medical cannabis program fund and that all monies collected pursuant to this article must be deposited into that fund. Is, that, is, that, is my understanding correct about that? And that's correct. Okay. And the money that is not spent out of that fund, so the leftovers, if you will. 
Now, the so revenues, B, and, the, yeah. and, let me, and just follow along with me in B, just to make sure I'm, I'm tracking with you. I guess I mm -hmm. want confirmation that, that I'm understanding it. That the revenues generated in excess of the amount needed to implement, administer, and enforce the article. Okay, that's revenues in excess. So, so the, the, I guess the implication there is this fund is, is to be used for implementation, administration, and enforcement of all of the components of this, this program. Correct. Okay. And the excess uh, above and beyond that that might be generated is split up in the committee amendment. 3% to... 3% to MUSC, 2% mm -hmm. for treatment. 3% to SLED. 3% to SLED. Let me ask you a question about that. Okay. Does that 3% to SLED, is that, that's not contemplated in the, in the enforcement? I mean, SLED would get money for enforcement of this, this uh, program out of, the, out of the fund on the first cut, basically, out of the fund before you start splitting it up. Or is it your intention, is it your, um, uh, your, your, well, your intention and your, uh, your, your understanding that to enforce this and to carry their responsibilities out, all they get is 3%. No, the argument would be that, that when SLED comes forward during the budgetary process and, and makes the case um, to, to the subcommittee as to what funds they need to carry out and enforce the laws of South Carolina, that included in that budget fund request, take into consideration if they received any money here through this program, because obviously that would, that would be credited against the amount that they need, um, and so the rest would come from the general fund. Um, but, and, 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 I, and I have no doubt that in the immediate future, a lot of it's going to come out of the general fund, but it's my expectation based on other states' experiences that, that the revenues generated over time, that 3% then becomes a substantial amount. Whether that's sufficient in order to compensate SLED for what it needs, you'd have to wait to a budget hearing to establish that. So I guess then that, that I guess is confounding a bit. All right, it, it, it's inconsistent because it, it, is it not that in B it says for the enforcement revenues in excess of those needed to enforce it, go to these to, to these different entities. No, because because the revenue that you're talking about there, this medical cannabis fund, that defrays DHEC. DHEC is the one in charge of this program. DHEC licenses the medical cannabis establishment. DHEC is the one that licenses the independent lab inspectors. DHEC is the one that issues these registry cars. DHEC is the one that carries the administrative burden here. And there, that's what we're talking about in terms of DHEC's costs in administering this program, okay? okay. What, th what this relates to, what you're pointing to is, okay, after that's been done, after DHEC has been made whole, DHEC doesn't need any more money, on specifying where those excess revenues go. To your point, am I saying that that's all the money SLED is going to need um, in order to, to discharge or carry out this law? I don't know. Right. It, it, it depends upon what SLED's actual needs are. Right. It depends on you know, what sort of revenue is thrown off by that 3%. I don't know. So, but that's my reading of that. And you, you've got their estimate, but you don't have confidence in that estimate. You've expressed that earlier. I, 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 and, and I guess, I, you know, uh, Yet yeah, the short answer to that is yes. Um, I, I honestly don't, given the, the number of medical cannabis establishments, the limited number in this bill, uh, I, I consider them to be limited uh, in nature, um, and, and given the fact that the administrative burden of administering the program is given to DHEC, I, I don't know on what basis, I'd be happy, I'd like to see it, where SLED says it needs 78 new employees to establish two new cannabis units. I mean, I don't, I, I don't, I haven't seen their presentation. That seems compared to other states, and I've checked, um, and, and the adjectives used to describe that have been ludicrous to outrageous. But I'm open to listening to why they think they need 78 new employees. And so, so assuming that, that um, DHEC uses a substantial amount of this money and the rest gets split up, and, and SLED gets 3% of that total, they'll also, I mean, it, 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 it seems likely that they will be requesting general funds above and beyond what they may get out of that 3% that's a percentage of something else. You know, I don't know, because I don't know what that 3% is going to be in monetary terms, and, and I don't know how you go about in terms of saying, okay, we're going to enforce all these laws we have in the code of laws, 
and their ability to section out by saying, this particular aspect of the law is going to cost us this. I don't know if SLED's ever done that. Does SLED, does SLED allocate or make budget requests? And I'm honestly asking the question. Do they make budget requests and then monetize each section of the code that they are to enforce? Is that how they break down their budget request? I, I can't answer your questions, I, I, but, I can't um, but let me go, let me keep moving on. I, yep. I, I, I get, at least I understand, and you've answered my question, it's your, it's your intention that they, that money would be used for enforcement on their side of the enforcement house that they may be called upon to do in this bill or otherwise. Uh, and I would also say this, I, I would not take that language to mean that they're precluded from coming before the certainly. General Assembly and asking for additional appropriations, if they can make that And case. isn't it true there's 85% of the money going to the general fund, so they could be dipping into exactly, those yeah. funds in, a, in another form. Um, th could you explain to me the 2% for treatment, what your thinking was on that with, you know, obviously we're launching into a, a very, um, um, I guess, progressive field here, so to speak, not field, but program, uh, that there is a lot of fear and concern that this may lead to increased drug abuse in South Carolina, uh, yet 2% to, to help those, which may be, I mean, it depends on your estimates, and we, we can pull out stat, you know, you can pull out a study, and I can pull out a study, we can go back and forth, sure. but, you know, if there's 20% of people that become marijuana dependent as a result of this and need treatment services, that's a pretty big number, to, it's going to be a pretty big number. Uh, do you genuinely feel that that 2% is sufficient to cover the, those needs that are, that are inevitably, for some, going to be, be real? Um, I'm not wed to that figure. Um, if you feel like more of the excess funds generated should be allocated to that, I'm open to that. I mean, there's no magic to those numbers, Senator. And the 5% that goes to MUSC to do permanent, 5% uh, for research um, to really test the effectiveness of cannabis um, and really expand the use of cannabis, essentially, to do research, to expand the use and, of, of cannabis for other, other illnesses and maladies, uh, that number, it, I guess I'm trying to figure out where these numbers came from because I, I, my problem, my concern, I will say, is you get 2% for treatment and you got 5% over here to try to find new markets, essentially. You to try to expand, expand the market because you can find new, new d diseases and you can add them to the list, then you got, you know, you got more business, you know, it's a good marketing program to have the, you know, the, the public pay for it. So help me with that, how these numbers got um, calculated. In, in terms of looking at what some of the, the areas we needed to be cognizant of, um, it seemed reasonable that some of the money be given to those involved in alcohol and drug abuse. It seemed reasonable to have SLED get a, a revenue stream. It seemed reasonable to provide some money to the Department of Education for drug safety education. Um, it seemed reasonable to give 5% for the research to the Senator from McCormick's point about research is important. I'm not wed to any of those figures. I mean, they're, they're not, you know, uh, platonic truths here. I mean, we can, we can make those numbers whatever we want those numbers to be. The, over on page 9, under 4453-2030. Hold on. Let me, let me get there. Sure. It's one, one page over. 22. Say it again, sir. 4453-2030. Uh, okay, gotcha. Um, this... This allows DHEC to implement a reasonable fee increase to be charged and collected pursuant to the, to the um, article for the department to cover the cost of administering and operating the program pursuant to the article. So as I read this, and can, you know, help me understand, as I read this, they can charge a fee to whomever they charge fees to in connection with this law to pay for 100% of, it would pay for 100%. Of the of the administration of the program by DHEC, it was meant to give them plenary authority in that regard. And um, uh, to your point, I guess what you're saying is, um, does that somehow mitigate against the generation of funds that would go to those those groups, or the surplus funds? I mean, is that is that what you're getting at? Well, this somehow the way I I will, I will let me rephrase my question. Yeah. Maybe the way or did you know that I read that? to say they can charge fees that are nondescript, doesn't tell you where they're getting them from, it's very, very vague, but they are permitted to charge fees sufficient to pay for 100% of the program. Right. Therefore, 
all up, then every other dollar they collect, aside from those fees, which pays for everything, would go into this split. It, essentially, you'd have this, this pot over here based on their fees. It pays for, pays for the program. Then you've got this pot over here that's in excess of, in the previous statute we talked about, the previous section we talked about, in excess of, and that's, and so that's 100, I mean, that, all that money is going to be in excess that, yeah. other than these fees. Is that, is, yeah, that, I, is I, my understanding I, correct? I, I take the point th that you're making, and, and I can just tell you what my intent is. My, my intent is that DHAC have the ability to levy fees, which um, coupled with the, 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 the sales tax revenue they're going to be getting, to levy fees up to covering the full amount of covering the program and no more is, is, my, is my intention. Um, it's not my intention to create an open-ended thing to where they can actually be generating just, and it may be that, that the sales tax is going to generate so much revenues that we need to either consider taking the sales tax off because it's being covered by other fees in the program, but I was, I was really anxious in drafting this to make it self-sustaining. I, I, I didn't want this to be, in the long term, something that had to be funded out of the general fund. I wanted it to be uh, almost like with the user fee with the gasoline tax. I mean, those that are accessing the program, those that are getting in, 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 you know, the, the, the medicine, to try to allocate the cost both on the patients who are doing that and on the, on the uh, medical cannabis establishments that are growing, processing, and dispensing, and those who are inspecting and transporting. So that's, my, that's the idea here, is to try to avoid an impact to the general fund. And if, and if I've done so imprecisely, then I'm happy to try to clean it up. So the, the, my next question is on section 4453-2040A, in addition to the fees that, that DHEC can charge to pay for the program, there's a 6% sales tax charged on all sales of, of marijuana um, at the point of sale. So I'm gonna assume that's dispensaries and not you're not char are you charging a sales tax from the grower no, to the it's, okay it's at, it's at the point of sale to the patient and all revenue collected pursuant to that tax goes, goes in that back fund. into the fund, the fund as well as the fees go back into the fund because everything you collect under the article goes back into the and fund then, and then and then 85 percent of it goes into the general fund so that that's sort of like the flow that's anticipated here but but again I'm not wed to, to any particular language. My overarching objective here is to make sure that the cost of administering the program fall upon both the medical cannabis establishments and the patients and that it not be something the general fund uh, finances. That, that's my objective. So let me jump up to page, well, my page 15, section 44532100. Yes, sir, I got it. Okay. And I'm jumping down to sub three, sub A. Yep. And there, once again, DHEC is allowed to charge the patients, the qualifying patients, non-resident card holders, and designated caregivers a fee for the cost of processing the applications and issuing the cards. Right. So that's a separate would be a considered a separate fee, but I think it's the way it's structured. It, it can only be used, or actually be used to pay for the actual processing, the, the staff time it takes to process the application, and the staff time it takes to generate the card and get it out the door to the patient designated caregiver or non-resident um, card holder. Right, it can't be any greater than the cost of processing and issuing the cards. But I must, again, would, Assume that this fee goes back into the fund. Mm -hmm. right. Let me take you to 18. Sir. And there's a fee that can be charged there for the same kind of thing, I suspect. But is it, is it my understanding that the... Um, what, section, what section is that, Senator? I'm sorry. Let me see here. Or subparagraph. I'm in the vicinity. If you just give me the number of paragraph. This is in B. Okay. B. Okay. Got B. And okay. Uh, subparagraph one A. Um, 
the yeah, annual renewal fee. Application or annual renewal fee is set by the department. Okay, once again, it's just another renewal, an applicant or application or renewal fee that can be charged by the department goes back into the fund. What I, and I, what I, yeah, what I tried to do, and I, and I take your point, is, is I'm trying to give plenary authority to the department in each of these instances um, to levy fees to cover costs. And, and again, the ultimate objective, policy objective is to not impact the general fund. And, and let me take you over to page, the following page 19. This is going to be in section, uh, well, it looks, it's toward the bottom of the page, section C. Is that how yours yes, looks? Yes, I got it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a. So the department shall deny, suspend, or revoke? Is that right? Language? Okay. You have some, oh, here we go. I'm sorry. You have some criminal penalties. Well, let me just ask it this way. You have criminal penalties in numerous sections, instead of just dragging you through them, it doesn't serve any purpose. You have criminal penalties in numerous sections of the bill uh, for a host of different, you know, uh, criminal acts. Misrepresentations. <laughs> Could be, there's some, the 500, if you, there's a fee, there's a fine, a civil fine, if you, if I believe, if you don't uh, change your address. If you don't notify the department, you change your address, you're subject to a $500 civil fine. Uh, but you also have some, and civil fines, you know, I, those would go back into the fund. That's a little different than a criminal fine. However, the criminal fines are subject to an entirely different sort of body of law that, mm -hmm. that divides those things up and sends them wherever they send them. And I guess my question is, what the, is was it your intention to have those criminal fines directed into the fund because those criminal fines are part of the article, their money's generated by the article, yet they're going back into the fund if I read your, if I read your proposal correctly? It, it, no, yeah, to the extent that, that it's not clear, um, criminal fines, it's not my intention to supersede existing law in regard to where criminal fines go. And you would know better than I as to, as to where those monies go. Um, but it's not my intention that those criminal fines um, supersede existing law in regard to where they go. So that section may need some cleanup. It, All of those criminal it, it sections need. And, and, could and to, need and, some cleanup. And to your point, and, and in regard to these, these instances where I say DHEC can charge fees and try to break it down, maybe some more clarity can be, can be had in regard to the nature of those fees and, and some more precise language drafted. And I'm happy to, to work on that. Thank you. Um, Page 48, there's a, uh, let me get to it. Bear with me, Senator, I'm sorry. Sure, no, no worries. There in, in section, it's on page 48, it's subparagraph D, just, just about a quarter of the way down. Um, and that's in what section? 44-53-2410? It's 44-53-2400. Uh, 2400, okay. Um, D, Paragraph got it. Okay, D. got it. Mm -hmm. And this again, I, I know it's tedious, but I just want to get, I just want to get my clarification. Sure. Uh, establish and charge an inspection fee in an amount to be determined by the department that will cover the expense of the department for conducting an inspection. So is it your, is it your, idea that every time DHEC goes into a, 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 a production facility or a dispensary to check on things, much like they do with uh, restaurants, if you think of it like that, doing a restaurant inspection, that they go in, they do their inspection, and they can essentially present a bill or you know, charge back against that business the cost of that inspection. It, it is. Again, the, the <clears throat> objective here was to try to allocate or distribute the cost of administering the program among the participants in that program. And on page 49, um, you kind of get into to the local government, land use, and I'm going to go with, uh, I'm talking about 4453-2420, section D. I'm sorry, uh, uh, 2420 section what? Section D. Um, I don't have a D in that section. I think you want to do the next one, 2430. Oh, I'm sorry. You're, you're correct. I apologize. Okay. 2430, section D. Right. A local government may not impose any tax or fee for the sale of medical cannabis products sold in the dispensary. Right. <clears throat> My question is, uh, the way I read that, they would not be allowed to charge a business license fee that is based on their gross sales. Is that your reading of it as well? It, 
It is. That's the reading. No tax or fee, so that will be inclusive of business license. I mean, was that your intention to exempt um, medical uh, to dispensaries be, from? To be, to be frank with you, that's the first time I ever thought about it being a carve out from the business license fees, to be honest with you. Um, the, the, the objective here, the intent was that I didn't want this to be a revenue raiser for local governments. Um, but, but I guess the point that you're making is to the, cons to the extent that it takes its place alongside other business operations throughout the state, it may be equitable to have them be treated the same way. And that's a fair point. Just might need to clean that up some too. Um, and then on page 54, um, and I'm going to take you to section four. It's on, pay on my page 54. Um, section four of the um, bill. Correct. Section four at the top. And it's got a, it says uh, 69. And it says cannabis sold by a dispensary to a cardholder uh, pursuant to this chapter, and isn't it true that, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it true that what that provision does is it exempts marijuana dispensaries from set paying sales taxes? It puts them on the exemption list. So over here, we're charging 6%, and yet over there, we're saying you don't have to pay the 6%. And it's just kind of, I mean, you see the reason well, for my confusion. And, and I picked that up um, in reviewing for this debate, and uh, I think it's the amendment we may be on right now, which deletes that, because you're right, there's an inconsistency between establishing a 6% sales tax and then referencing a provision that says you're exempt. And so, it's, again, that was on the desk the first day. But you're right to point out that that is an inconsistency. And the, um, I, I, that's all the revenue questions I have. I think it's it covers the, the waterfront with the concerns I had and the, some of the cleanups that appear to be wanting in the, in the bill on, as it relates to revenue. Um, yes, sir. Explain to me, and I looked at page 55, and I'm looking at section 8 now. Okay, hold on. Let me get there. Just, just walk me through how this thing, because you've got at least two computer systems, the best I can tell, that you've got to set up at least two, and it might be another one in there. And you've got forms that have to be generated. You have regs that have to be adopted uh, at all levels for dispensaries, for you know, production facilities, for processing facilities. Uh, you have to come up with a security. SLED has to come up with a security plan for everybody's business, essentially. No, they can, they, they're, they, no each establishment comes up with a security plan in consultation with SLED. So. Right, right. But I mean, security, yeah, I'm sorry. Right, right. But SLED what, has what, to what be... What section in, are we on? They're Senator, engaged. I'm well, I'm, I'm getting you to section eight, and I'm kind of, kind of laying out all the, the many parts of this um, bureaucracy that we are establishing with this bill. And I'm, I'm curious, I'm having a hard time following along exactly when it goes into effect. Okay. I know that there's a part in here, if I remember, understand correctly, that if it didn't have to, if it don't have it up and running by two years, then somebody could bring suit and, and sort of a, I guess, a writ of mandamus or some sort of suit like that to force them to, to, to you know, get, get off their backside or quit dragging their feet. But I get that. I mean, I understood there was sort of this drop dead at two years. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it seemed a bit all over the boards. And I was wondering if you could sort of walk me through. Yeah. Let me take a look here. Okay, okay so... Um, after the effective date of the act, which would be when the governor signs it or uh, you know, whatever, when it goes into effect, um, that they have, they have to create a commission, the commission we talked about, um, within 30 days. Um, it talks about their obligation to develop a written certification form, which is the, the form to be completed by um, the physician in authorizing the use of cannabis no later than 10 days after the effective date of regulations that have been promulgated. It talks about those regulations to be promulgated to be um, no later than one year after the effective date of the act. Um, it then talks about DHEC's um, obligation to engage a company to create the necessary software for an electronic patient registry um, no later than 120 days after the effective date of this act. It requires them to develop the safety flyer, safety information flyer, um, no later than, which, which has to be available at the point of sale so that patients get them, uh, no later than 10 days after the effective date that regulations are promulgated, and to establish a secure web-based verification system um, within one year of the effective date. 
um, and then promulgate regulation pursuant to section 44-5323.50, no later than one year, begin accepting applications for licensure um, no later than 30 days after the effective date of the regulations. And so I guess the question is, how do we come up with those dates? How do we come up with those times? What, um, and as best I can recall, in talking with DHEC, and DHEC provided some feedback in regard to what it thought were reasonable times, um, and we started from that and worked from that. To be honest with you, Senator, I don't remember whether we materially altered what DHEC had sent to us or whether I just simply took them verbatim. I, I need to go back and check my notes on that. But it would have been as an initial matter asking DHEC, okay, these are all the things, and, and they, they went through this act, and, and much of this act was kind of drafted by their attorney. Um, and so I asked them, I said, okay, this, this contemplates you doing various things. Give me an idea of the time that you would need. And, and that was the point of departure for getting this. But I need to go back and see whether or not we took what they sent us verbatim or whether I adjusted it. So I should ask DHEC? No, you can ask me, and, and I'll find out what my notes are in okay. regard to what DHEC provided and how, how this bill ultimately turned out. Okay. Um, and I left one of my revenue questions out. I, I just recalled it. Um, the, this is a, has to be a cash business, correct? That's no. my understanding. It's not. No. Okay. Um, the Department of Treasury, um, and let me, let me be precise here so that... Um, I want to talk in generality about something that's that important. My tabs are getting bent, so I'm... Okay. Um, the United States Department of Treasury has what's called a FinCEN division, which is an acronym for Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. And FinCEN, I'm going to read from um, the, uh, its, its promulgation of, of, of guidelines to marijuana-related businesses. They provide guidance to clarify how financial institutions can provide services to marijuana-related businesses consistent with their BSA, and BSA is Bank Secrecy Act obligations, and aligns the information provided by financial institution in BSA reports with federal and state law enforcement priorities. This FinCEN guidance should enhance the availability of financial services for and the financial transparency of marijuana-related businesses. So, so FinCEN, a uh, division of the Department of Treasury, promulgates guidelines that banks and credit unions have to follow if they want to accept deposits from cannabis-related industry. And there was a recent uh, case, I think about earlier this year, maybe late last year, or uh, last year or the year prior, where there was a credit union uh, for the first time, really, that uh, Treasury came down on them and, and fined them for taking deposits from marijuana or cannabis-related industry and not following these fin FinCEN guidelines. Um, so that having been said, um, it's expensive to, to comply with that. You have to hire attorneys, you have to hire accountants. There's a, there is a layer um, of cost associated with taking deposits from cannabis-related industry. And, that, and that's why you've seen such a push at the federal level to modify federal banking laws so that these particular FinCEN requirements were no longer in place. But, but it, it can be, you can use these financial institutions that follow these guidelines. And, and to be frank with you, many of the institutions decide not to do it because it's financially prohibitive. And I want to be transparent about that. It, it, is, it is an onerous thing, but it can be done. So in practice, in most states, this is generally a cash business. I think it's fair to say that because of those constraints, the number of financial institutions participating that you, you have, but, but, I, but that's not the case with like, for instance, a friend of mine in Maryland, we went up to visit his dispensary. He's got a bank that he has a relationship with, so he does use banking. I don't know the percentages, but it's fair to say, it's fair to say that for many institutions, it's cost prohibitive, and so the medical cannabis establishment does have more of a cash component to it than other industry does. And they can pay their taxes in cash. I mean, there's nothing, you know, they could, you know, they, they can pay taxes and they do pay taxes to the federal government, to state government, and certainly cash is an acceptable um, form of tender yeah. still. Yeah, and, they, and, he, and even there though, Senator, um, the, 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 the guidelines that have been issued by the IRS, um, th there are certain restrictions on what medical cannabis establishments can do in terms of cost of goods sold, deductions, and whatnot. They're treated differently by the IRS. 
but the IRS issues those guidelines, and, and of course, cash can be is always a good Certainly. Move, so, move of exchange. Yeah. So wh I guess I was curious, what do you contemplate as the dispensary has all these fees, fines, you know, whatever, inspection fees, taxes, and they, they walk down to DHEC with a sack full of money? Is that how this is going to go? Uh, I don't know if they walk with a sack. Maybe they use a briefcase. Um, Fair enough. I, I, don't, I, 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 I would think, um, uh, again. I, they, I was thinking um, about some of my no, clients. No, 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 I, they no, use no, a sack full. They use a little, a little yeah. sack. Um, I would like to see it easier for credit unions and, and, um, and banks to participate in the cannabis industry. They can, um, and there are guidelines issued by Treasury, to your point, uh, a lot of those requirements are expensive and a lot of institutions choose not to do it. But many do. Yeah, and, um, and, I, and I get that you would like the federal law to change. I understand that, but that's not where we're living. And that's not what, as we look at the consequences and the practicalities of this proposal, isn't it true that we have to look at where we live, not where we would like to live? Yeah, I, yeah. I, so, um, I, I, so it, I guess my question is, they're going to be de you know, have a deposit cash with DHEC is, is that what you foresee? And these are going to be startups, true? Unless, these will, all of them will be startups. And, so Unless they have a relationship with a credit union or a bank, which they can have. Correct. If they do not, if they choose not to do that, um, they would have to get those, those monies to DHEC in another way. So if this money that's sort of federally illegal, for lack of a better way to describe it, you know, it's tainted in some way, gets to DHEC, then does, when it becomes DHEC, does that sort of wash the taint off of it? Or does DHEC have to figure out how to deal with this cash? All I can tell you is in the 37th, or 36 days, 37th was just last week, so I don't have it set up yet, um, the state agencies have been able to receive the fees in a way that was not complicated and did not result in disgorgement um, and didn't constitute money laundering. So I can only point to the experience, and again, we're not creating something out of whole cloth here, okay? We're, we, we have the ability to look at what 36 states have been doing for a long time and, and kind of draw some lessons from that. And so, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, that, that somehow this being a, a, a cash business because of the difficulty of accessing financial institutions, that there's going to be somehow tainted money, money that's going to complicate things for state agencies. All I can say is I've not seen that as being in the experience in the states that have medical cannabis. Okay. Uh, well, have you, have you, have you, did you contemplate putting, you know, including a section in your bill that addressed that issue, that provided you know, DHEC, instead of them sort of standing there going, well, I wonder if we, you know, can we take it, can we not take it? What is it, you know, what does the federal government say? I mean, we're putting them in, it feels like to me, we're putting them in a very vulnerable position for a state employee who's making, you know, $35,000 a year uh, to, to, you know, to, to try to sort all this out. Did you, did you consider adding something like that into your bill that would I, pattern another state? Or? Yeah, I, ha I haven't, but, um, but I, I take your point. And um, as I've done throughout this debate, when I think valid points are made, I'll sit down and figure out if there's a way uh, to not only clean up the fees to the extent that there may be some ambiguity there, but to maybe specify the remittance of those fees or to establish some protocols or, or discuss that. I mean, I think that's a valid point you're making. I appreciate your patience with me, and thank you for responding to my questions. Thank you, Senator. Okay, that concludes my remarks. I appreciate the opportunity Mr. to present for you. Senator from Ori, Senator Henry, what purpose do you ask? I'd like to speak on the bill. Uh, let us publish. We need to publish the First Amendment first, then I recognize that the reading clerk will read. Amendment number 1A is by Senator Davis, Men's a bill, page 54, lines 4 through 8. Strike section four in its entirety. Senator, Senator from Ori is recognized. Senator from Ori, Senator Hembry, what purpose do you rise? Speak on the bill. To speak on the amendment. Speak on the amendment. He's recognized. Senator is recognized. Senator Maury. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, 
I've got a lot to say about this bill. But before I do this, um, I want to, to share a thought with, with my fellow senators. I think sometimes, I know for myself, I think sometimes that we don't fully appreciate the gravity and the weight of the job that we have. We come up here three days a week and we, you know, we kind of sail from one meeting to the next and we do it for a while and it starts to sort of see, there's a routine that develops and there are friends and relationships that develops and there's a pattern to it that develops. And it sort of feels like, you know, I mean, we're just kind of doing a job. You know, we're just carrying this out. But every once in a while, I think it's really important for us to stop and think of what our fellow citizens have entrusted in us. Um, it's not routine. They're trusting us with their very safety. They're trusting us with the safety of their families and their friends. And they are counting on us. They are expecting us to do right by them. And they are counting on us to do things and make decisions fully informed, okay, thoughtfully considered with their best interest and safety at heart. And when we say and we make that decision, we put the stamp of approval of the General Assembly, of the South Carolina Senate, the South Carolina House, and the governor of South Carolina, that citizen is going to feel confidence that what we have told them is true, that what we have told them is safe, that what we have told them will make their lives better, not worse. And that is my problem fundamentally with this concept. Because, I was, I've said this before, if we were debating recreational marijuana, I would feel a lot more comfortable. I wouldn't vote for it, okay? I think it's a bad idea. But... I would feel more comfortable because we, would, we wouldn't be talking about this is going to be good for you. This is going to make you healthy. This is going to be, make you better. We'd be talking about a dangerous substance like alcohol. We'd be talking about a dangerous substance like tobacco that we've decided we're going to make legal. And we'd be able to tell our citizens, look, this is a bad idea. There are all these health problems that are real. That, that, that's one of the problems with this whole thing. You've got some, you've got some people it helps, and you've got some people it, it ruins. And it's all over the boards. That's why the FDA hadn't come out except for four drugs, but they, they haven't come out and said, oh, we've got it all figured out. That's the conundrum we're in, because it's dangerous for a lot of people. So, um, I'm not comfortable I would be more comfortable then because we, if we did it recreationally, then we could say, look, we're putting a label on this thing. It's bad for you. It's a bad, don't do it unless you just want to. But you understand you're on your own, okay? You're a free citizen, state of South Carolina. You get to make decisions like this. But what we're doing with this proposal is we're sending a different message. We're saying something else. And I don't, I, 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 I'll get into the doctors later, and, and we'll talk about that some. But our, the ones that we have promised and pledged to take care of and look out for, they are going to hear us say, yes, it's okay, and that's where they're going to stop. Okay? They're not going to go through all the studies. They're not going to do all this digging and, and, and like Senator Davis has and like I have and many of you have already done to look at the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. They're just going to say, well, the government says it's okay. The government says it's medicine. Medicine is good for you. Medicine is good, right? Medicine is good for you. Medicine makes you better. Medicine makes you healthy. The state said so. And for us. As, from, as, as politicians, as public servants, put it that way, as public servants, for all walks of life, all sorts of jobs, all sorts of expertise, okay? For us to step into the shoes of the Food and Drug Administration, who is, has that responsibility, we rely upon them, 
all day long. Doctors rely upon them. Patients rely upon them for many, many years. For us to say, you know, we're really better at this than you are. You kind of, we, we, we don't like the answer we're getting from you. So we, being the, the, the South Carolina Senate, with our vast experience in, in evaluating effective medications for patients, we're going to tell the folks back home, it's okay. I can't believe I'm even having this conversation. That seems so crazy to me. I, 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 I just, I don't, it's like I just sort of talk to myself, going, what in the world? I mean, who thinks that? You know, is there anybody in here who thinks they're smarter than the Food and Drug Administration? Of course not. Uh, well, wait, 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 wait. Sen let Senator, me get, let me get, let me make, you refuse, I'm about refuses to shift to gears yield here, so time. let me shift no, I gears. Um, I want to, I want to let this body know. It's a 57 page bill. I've read it and read it and read it. There are lots of points, point, little pointy parts to it. Lots of questions, lots of problems, lots of problems. I'm going to review those problems with you. It is going to be tedious. It is going to be, you're going to be tired of hearing me. I'm almost now tired of hearing me. Um, but it's important for you to hear it. You need to learn it. Because I know some of you have read it all the way through. I every single word. Studied it. Not just read it. Studied it. Thought about it. Contemplated it. And you're, you know where you are. Okay? You've made up your mind based on what you understand in this bill. And you're one way or, no, or another. And that's okay. And if, you, if you're there, maybe you can... Go on out and get some dinner, because that's probably a good idea. But if you're not, or if you haven't contemplated each and every paragraph and each and every line, then I, I urge you to, to be patient with me and let me do that with you. I'm not going to take any questions at this point. I will go through the entire bill. After that, I will avail myself to the questions that come from the body. So I'm happy to do that. Uh, I respect Senator Davis' uh, willingness to, to do that, you know, for a very long time, and uh, what's good for the, for the center from Buford is good for the center from Maury. So, um, um, I would be um, happy to start tomorrow. Um, as a matter of fact, I would prefer to start tomorrow, but I don't want, to, I, I want to be respectful of, of, you know, the, the calendar and the schedule and, and so forth, but. I'm, yeah, I'll. Senator from Charleston, Senator Kimson, what purpose do you rise? Uh, parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. Uh, how many amendments are on the desk? That's the current number. Um, oh. My understanding is 28 amendments on the desk. Thank you. Senator from Ori. Stand at ease momentarily. Unanimous consent to stand at ease. Unanimous consent to stand at ease. Sen Senator, you proceed. Senator from, Senator from Ori retains the floor.
Senator from Edgefield, what purpose do you rise, sir? Mr. President, I'm going to have a unanimous consent request. Okay. Um, State your request. I think with the with with what the senator from Ori has previewed as as to how long his remarks may take, um, I, I want to make sure that the senator has plenty of time to do that. Um, we made sure that the senator from Buford had plenty of opportunity to outline his points. We want to make sure that others have plenty of opportunity as well. Um, I think it might be better if we give the Senator from Maury tomorrow to make those comments as opposed to doing that later tonight. Um, but I, I would ask unanimous consent that the rule limitation on a Senator speaking no more than twice on any one amendment be waived for the Senator from Maury on this amendment. Is there objection? Hearing none, so ordered. Now, Mr. President, I think that the Senator from Clarendon is going to want to make some remarks. So m maybe if the Senator from Maury is, is agreeable, maybe he could he could come back to his seat, allow the Senator from Clarendon to speak, and the Senator from Maury could speak tomorrow. Perhaps a unanimous consent request that's, that I will retain the floor after the Senator from Clarendon speaks. All right. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that with the Senator from Maury retaining the floor, on this amendment that the senator from Clarendon be allowed to speak on the amendment. Is is there is there objection to that? Unanimous consent request. Hearing none. So ordered. Thank you. Senator from Clarendon is wrecked by by that to uh, speak on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President and Senator members McClain. of the Senate. Um, and for a fact, I won't be long at all. I think everybody understands the position that I have with this bill and how I feel about it. I was almost hesitant to, uh, to do this because I could tell that uh, already the Senator from, from Ori, Senator Embry, had already made some points that I was going to make. And I was going to also say that based on all my involvement in this bill, ever since eight years ago when I was a member of the subcommittee, and I've said it several times, that I would have rather had been debating recreational marijuana as opposed to medical marijuana. And as the Senator from Orvis said, I would probably vote against that bill, but based on folks who have contacted me um, about this bill, um, it looks like um, what they wanted anyway, and what they're hoping is going to transpire from this is medical marijuana. So I will tell you, somebody mentioned Julian's Law. Um, I think that's the bill that we passed a few years ago that uh, legalized the oil in the, in the marijuana. We had those hearings, and it was very sad to see so many parents roll in to the meeting room with their children, some in wheelchair and some wearing protective helmets because they had so many seizures in a day. And it was made clear to us that it was something about the oil, I think minus the THC, that if a, a young child was having 100 seizures a day, they may only have two or three. So, of course, I supported that, and I was glad that it passed. And then I also supported um, industrial hemp. A lot of folks who contacted me back when we were debating that bill thought that when we passed industrial hemp, we were passing marijuana, but, but it wasn't, but I did support that. So I just want to let you know that I did support those, but I don't support this medical marijuana bill. And, 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 and as you all know, I've never tried to convince anybody to agree with me. I've never tried to put my name on a bill or block the bill, but I just uh, have some observations that I made. The Senator from McCormick held up a book. Well, I have a book that I was given back when I was on a subcommittee, and it's by William Bennett, who is the former Secretary of Education for the United States of America, and it's entitled, Going to Pot, Why the Rush to Legalize Marijuana is Harming America. And I've had a lot of information given to me about this bill, but I found most of what I like about opposing the bill in this book. It makes a lot of uh, great points as far as why medical marijuana is bad. And, and I often wonder, as I listen to the debate, why we keep referring to this as a medicine. I don't think it's a medicine, but that's just my opinion. Uh, other people have their own opinion. 
I think somebody said earlier that I think maybe the senator from Ori, and I agree with this, that some people do find relief from marijuana. Some people do. But I think a lot of people don't. And I will tell you that most of the people who contacted me about this bill, it wasn't about any type of medicinal value. It was about getting high. And most of the folks who contacted me about this bill, and I don't mean to be ugly, but to be downright honest, they were potheads. That's what they were. They saw this bill as a way to uh, have access to marijuana legally, and uh, that's why they supported the bill. Nothing to do with medicine value, whatever. Um, I would tell you that I, I've had many people, when I was on the subcommittee, I was attacked personally by an individual, and he just went off. It didn't bother me, and he apologized later. But he was telling, telling us, he's from California, I think, about how marijuana is so uh, beneficial and this and that and everything and whatever. And I think the very next day, somebody sent me a picture of him on Facebook with arm blows of marijuana. So it turns out the guy stood to make a lot of money if the bill passed in South Carolina. I also had one uh, a visit that stuck out in my mind. Uh, a guy came to my office. He rolled in in his wheelchair. I think he said he was a veteran. And he explained how he has all these excruciating pains and other issues. And the only thing that helps him is marijuana. And when that guy left my office, I really felt bad for him. He didn't convince me, but I felt bad for him because I know that people do suffer from a lot of uh, issues. But I guess it wasn't 10 minutes before I got a phone call. The guy was from Sumter. Somebody called me from Sumter and said, look, there's not a thing wrong with him. He borrowed the wheelchair. There's nothing wrong with him. He just, he's a pothead. He wants marijuana. That weighed heavy on me. What also weighed heavy on me are some physicians that I have a lot of respect for back home. Early on in this debate, seven, eight years ago, we talked about medical marijuana. And they told me how much they were against it. They told me that how, how many, uh, the increasing number of young people that were coming to their practice depended upon marijuana. And I will tell you, I told you before, by choice, I live in the neighborhood I grew up in. I built a house right next to my mother. I contemplated moving several times, but I stayed there. And so on the other side of the street, behind that is an apartment complex. Gang activity and all the things that young people do, they shouldn't do. So I get to see firsthand how marijuana has just destroyed people's lives, especially young people, and more especially young black people. So I go to the barber shop, because of COVID, we're outside waiting, the only two in the, allowed in the shop at a time. And I'm sitting there in the car, in my truck, with my adopted grandson, my grandson. And all we can smell is marijuana, because all the young guys, 20, 25, 30 years old, sitting in the cars and trucks, waiting to get a haircut, smoking marijuana. And then I go inside the barber shop, and the last time I went there, and I hope he's not watching, but if he is, whatever. The last time I went there, I almost choked because of the marijuana. So I went back to another barber right now. And I remember one day I was, uh, I was taking my grandson to school and we stopped to get a haircut before we went to school. And the, the, the scent of marijuana in the barber shop was just strong. And I said, I'm gonna take him to school and he's gonna smell like marijuana. And I know what they're gonna think. Then I can know that I'm a person that never even tried, never had a puff of marijuana cigarette. I've been around enough of it in high school and college. But anyway, um, the other thing I want to say about this bill is that there's been a lot of talk about uh, the percentage of people that think that marijuana, uh, they want to see mar uh, medical marijuana. Now, I don't think the whole story has been told. I read a study, and I think it was conducted by Winthrop University, and it said that 70% of the people will like to see marijuana medical marijuana made legal, but the second half of that statement is if it's regulated by the FDA. So I think we need to get the whole story out there. So this is what I was found in this book. It said in 2012, 34,000 people had a med medical marijuana card. 3.7% used the card to help ease cancer symptoms. 1.5% for glaucoma, 1.6% for AIDS, but 89.8% .8 of those people out of that 34,000 that had that marijuana card 
use it for pain, just terrible pain. But the other part of the story is that only 13% of those folks were over 60 years old. 73% were men between the ages of 18, 18 and 30 years old, which is normally the most healthy part of our community, had a car saying they, they needed medical marijuana for pain. I talked about already about me medical marijuana being more expensive than how you can get marijuana now, and I'm concerned about how, if this bill passes, how the people in my community that I live next door to and I live next door to them all, all of their lives, all of my life, how they're going to afford to get marijuana. Shouldn't they have relief? But it's going to be more expensive. I also read in this book that not a single state that passed medical marijuana, and this book was written in 2012, that's when I was on the subcommittee, so maybe things have changed, but not a single state that passed medical marijuana has not, well, all, all of the states that pass it now have recreational marijuana. So just as people are hoping, we pass medical marijuana, and the next thing we're going to pass is recreational use, making marijuana legal. There was an article in the Denver Post that stated that nearly three quarters of teens in two metro area substance abuse programs said that they used me medical marijuana that was bought or grown for someone else. And that's what's gonna happen in this case, just like it happens with opioids, and to be honest with you, just like it happens with like Viagra. People have prescriptions for those types of drugs, and then those drugs end, in, end up in the hands of people who shouldn't get it. So a lot of young people are gonna have access to this medical marijuana because somebody they know uh, has a prescription for it, and they're going to either give it to them, they're going to sell it to them, or they're going to take it from them. Marijuana used by 12 to 17-year-olds is dramatically higher in states that have legalized marijuana. Young people are going to have access to marijuana more than ever before, and they are going to have brain not developing correctly. They're going to become dependent on marijuana, and they're going to go to other uh, more harsh drugs. Nationwide, over 70% of teens admitted to a substance abuse program claim that marijuana is their drug of abuse. Not alcohol, not cigarettes, not prescription drugs, but marijuana. In 2010, marijuana contributed to nearly 3,000 traffic fatalities or 12% of all traffic deaths. So my thought process is that the more we make marijuana available, the more we're going to have people out on the highways and byways driving under the influence of marijuana. I just told you about getting rear-ended in Charlotte and uh, got out the car and all I could smell was marijuana. And the other sad part of that story, the lady that hit me had a little three or four-year-old daughter in the car with her and she's driving around smoking marijuana. Dr. Sanjay Gupta one time said that back in 2009, he supported the concept of medical marijuana. And then after he made the comment, he did some research search and studies, and in 2013, he apologized for saying that mar medical marijuana was a good thing because he realized that it wasn't. And then I don't agree with the concept, it's at least being implied that medical marijuana is a cure for everything. I say I, I will agree that some people get relief from marijuana. I don't know if they just in such a state of high, they don't know they're in pain or whatever, but I do realize that some people get relief. I got a letter today from a guy back in my district asking me to support this bill. He says because he's a 100% disabled veteran and uh, he has to smoke two joints a night so that he can sleep. And uh, then I got another email that was saying just the opposite of why they didn't want to uh, see this bill pass. I believe it's a gateway drug. I know of people who started off with marijuana, they went to crack, they went to heroin, they went to meth, and they went to their grave. And we know of people, celebrities, I'm not gonna call their name, not names now because they have families, but we know of celebrities. They started off with alcohol and marijuana and one thing led to the other, and either they just killed themselves or they committed suicide or whatever, we know of that. 
Um, I had a question about the fiscal impact, but I think that question was addressed a while ago. And then I have a question also that I'll look back at the bill to see if this bill will even allow uh, the tracking so we will know how much marijuana a person has and is there anything to say how much, if, if I have a bad back, I can get X amount. If you have a back and you, your problem is worse than mine, or can everybody get the same amount? The amounts of medical marijuana that I read that people can get, I think every two weeks, to me is alarming. So we know that the South Carolina Medical Association is against the bill. The South Carolina Pediatric Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Ophthalmological Society, they're against the bill. The American Medical Association, American Society of Addiction Medicine, Addictive Medicine, and we all got the, the correspondence from the South Carolina uh, Baptist Convention where they are adamantly opposed to medical marijuana that's not regulated by the FDA. In this book, it says that marijuana use is not safe and it's not harmless. It says it's dangerous. For the most part, proponents want to help people by promoting a form of alternative medicine. And those of us who oppose the bill, we want to prevent the dangers that this bill would, would cause if it's passed. So I wonder, as I read somewhere, how does the insurance industry feel? Because they're going to have to insure all of these people. How do educators feel? Teachers and you know, administrators, they have their hands full already, which reminds me, I go to the basketball games. My wife don't like it because of COVID, but I put my mask on and because of my back, they let me sit in a regular chair by the door, and I sit there, y'all, and I'm telling you, um, these young people coming in at that gym, just like the barbershop, full of marijuana. How do manufacturers feel? I talk to a lot of my uh, industrial people, Continental and, and, and all those companies that are in my district, and it's amazing how people say, oh, you know, it's no jobs out there. Jobs are out there. And we have people applying for these jobs. There's a lot of them are highly educated. They go through the entire hiring process. And the last step in the process is the test for drugs, the test for marijuana. And a lot of people, particularly young people, are getting turned down for good jobs with good pay and great benefits because they have marijuana in their system. How does law enforcement feel? We know that, that most law enforcement oppose this bill. And they've explained to me why they are against it, and I agree with them. I've talked to, to the sheriffs in my district. We know SLED is against the bill. A lot of police chiefs are against it. And maybe it was a senator from, from, from uh, Ori. I had the same question. We just passed a bill, and I'm coming to an end. We just passed a bill to repeal the knee program. Against the wishes of the South Carolina Medical Association, who knows more about what we need to do in that area than them. Now we're going to pass a bill to make medical marijuana legal against the advice of law enforcement and a great deal of the medical community. So I'm wondering too, do we know more about this than them? And I don't think that it's our job, I think it's the FDA's job as it was alluded to earlier, it's their job to determine what's a medicine and what's not a medicine. And, you know, we have uh, been dealing with this bill for eight years. And I've said to Senator Davis, the Senator from Buford privately, and I said it publicly. He has done a great job with this bill. The bill we first debated, to me, was an atrocity. The bill we debate today, although I'm still against it, it's a much better bill. And I credit him for that. I really do. And I, I know that what he wants to do is to help people like the lady over here. But I really believe that if we pass this bill, we're going to have some drastic unintended consequences that we may look back and say, you know what, we probably did the wrong thing. I know 37 states have passed it, but in this book and other studies I've seen, there are a lot of folks, especially in Colorado and California, that regret that they ever passed a medical marijuana bill. But my biggest concern is, like I said, I, I, I communicate with people every day in my community who have completely messed their life up because of marijuana and then other drugs. I know these people. They're friends, they're family members, they're church members, 
And if this bill passes, I think that the, the concerns I have will be greatly increased. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator from Edgefield, what purpose do you rise? Uh, Mr. President, with Senator from Orie retaining the floor, I'd ask to be recognized um, briefly to discuss scheduling. Your Senator from Edgefield is recognized. Please give him your attention. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Senators, I, I think I think we all anticipated that this was going to be a, a a lengthy conversation, um, and uh, and the conversation I think has been good. It's been it, it's been a good um, educational conversation back and forth. Of course, the senator from Beaufort needed a lot of time in order to um, lay out his position, and and of course he had a number of questions that he had to answer as well. Those were good questions, I think. So I, I appreciate how we've acted so far and how we've how we've gone about. I know there are a number of other people who want to speak as well. Um, I think we also recognize that at some point we're going to have to bring this to a head. Um, so after speaking with, I talked with the president, talked with the chairman of judiciary, chairman of finance, and also the democratic leader. Um, here's what I hope we can do. I hope that tomorrow we'll get back on this I hope we can go in just a few minutes tonight, but then tomorrow we can get back on this um, this bill and uh, the Senator from Maury will have the floor on it so that he can uh, begin and hopefully conclude his remarks tomorrow. If, um, if, if he finishes at an agreeable time, maybe somebody else can speak. Um, but I understand tomorrow's Thursday. Uh, we all know how that is. Um, but next week... Um, my understanding from speaking with the senator um, from Maury, the chairman of the judiciary, is that judiciary, the full judiciary does not plan to meet next Tuesday. I understand from the senator from Cherokee that finance does need to meet, but hopefully it won't be too long of a meeting. So finance committee members cooperate with us here. Hopefully it won't be too, too long of a meeting. So well, what I'm going to propose to do is that tomorrow that I make a motion that we alter the, the hours of business on Tuesday such that finance committee would come in and they would full committee would meet at 12 on Tuesday. Hopefully then we can meet in our individual respective caucuses at one and then the full Senate could meet at two o'clock on Tuesday. Now, in saying that, I think I should also say this, we should be prepared for Tuesday to be a late night. Right, we need to make progress on this. Wednesday, we'll have the same schedule, hopefully, if everyone will go along with this. But Wednesday, we should plan for there to be a late night uh, so that we can try to, try to move this bill along. Uh, but that would give us afternoon and evenings on Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, hopefully, we can make some significant progress and we can um, get to the point where we start not only voting on amendments, but hopefully get to a vote on the, on the bill as amended if it's amended um, next week as well. Uh, so I, I'll make that motion tomorrow, but I wanted just to kind of give everybody an outline of what I hope we'll do. I um, want to let you know what I was thinking and that um, after speaking with uh, other members and leadership, I think we've got an agreement that that might work. So hopefully we can try to set up that schedule tomorrow before we leave. Uh, so Mr. President, I think now would be a good time if anybody has any unanimous consent requests. I think we are about finished for the evening. Senator from York. President asked for unanimous consent to recall H4495 from the Judiciary Committee and place it on the calendar. This bill is simply a renaming bill of precincts that already exist, and uh, Senator Rankin has approved of this. Is there objection to the unanimous consent request? Hearing none, so ordered. It's recalled and we placed on the calendar. Senator from Orangeburg, what purpose do you rise? Senator Unanimous Hutto. consent request to read the box. Unanimous consent request to read the box. Is there objection? Senator, two bills. Without objection, clerk will read. Introduction of a bill by Senator Hutto. 
to prohibit the use of restraint or confinement and to provide exceptions in amending further sections relating to out-of-home custody of juveniles. Judiciary Committee. Introduction of a bill by Senator Fanning. It amends the code relating to the requirements of certain gasoline user fee funds so as to provide that 15% of a county's apportionment of C funds must be expended on certain rural roads. Finance Committee. The desk is clear. Senator Edgefield, are there? Mr. President, if there are no other unanimous consent requests, I ask unanimous consent that with the Senator from Ori retaining the floor on this bill that the Senate do now adjourn. Unanimous consent that the Senate do now adjourn with the Senator from Ori holding the floor. Is there objection? Any objection? Hearing none, the Senate stands adjourned to meet at 11 a.m. tomorrow, Thursday. <laughs>